Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, hope you can hear and see me okay. Do let me know in the chat because I'm having my, my volume meters aren't doing anything, so I assume it's just fallen over again. Streamlabs, it's great software. Doesn't half fall over all the time. Oh, I mean, it keeps the stream going, but the software falls over. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is another uh, Gumpla Times. Gumpla Times. I'm still working on this as I'll be. I will be for many moons. Uh, so rather than just sit here and listen to some podcasts or some music while I work, I'll hang out with you guys and have some fun. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, be on for a little while today, don't know how long, but at the moment we are going to be working on the Sazabi Verkar, which is the Sazabi Verkar Ver Shanghai Dragons Ver Borderlands. It's my Patreon reward bill for my very good dear friend George, you know George, uh, building it for him. It's his Patreon reward because he's one of my top tier patrons, so we're working on that. Uh, if you remember the last few episodes, I have been working on the yellow armor, which I don't have any of here right in front of me, but oh, there we go. I've been working on the yellow armor which you can see is now all the color for the yellow is now done there's obviously chipping and stuff and stuff to go on but the base color with all the pre-shading that's actually been done as post shading is now on you can see here the red's not been done yet but that the yellow has been done uh, now interestingly uh, remind me in a bit i'll tell you about the texture so that's been done what we're working on today or what i'd say we it's just it's just me what i'm going to be working on today is the red armor there's much more red armor than there is yellow armor i'll just put this back over there uh, so it, you think it might take a long time but we've got a much simplified process for the red armor uh, whereas the yellow armor was how would what, what did we do for the yellow armor well i'll go through that in a minute before i do all that let's just say hello to everybody uh, welcome welcome it's one of my normal streams so basically it's just a chance for us all to hang out together while i do some work I, I, unlike my warhammer sunday where i do bugger all uh, i tend to do a fair bit of work on these streams because it's the whole point is you're keeping me company while i work so we're going to do that as always uh, if you're watching this the chat is here if you want to join in the live chat if you're watching this and you can't type comments <clears throat> uh, then you need to click on the YouTube icon that's down here in the bottom right hand corner of the player somewhere. That will take you to the YouTube page where the stream is and you can do the typey typey and join in. And please do join in. Like I say, the whole point of the stream is for me to have some company of you guys while I'm working. You know, I've got chat to, I'll have chat to read and stuff. I forgot to bring Guthorm out. I always forget to bring Guthorm out. There we go. <clears throat> you guys are my company while I'm doing this. You're keeping me company. There's nothing worse than sitting here working alone when you've got people you can hang out with, friends that you can hang out with while you work. So yeah, do come and join in the live chat. Uh, it's always a good laugh and the people in chat are awesome. They're always awesome. I have to say, by the way, I've said this before and I'll say it again. All my followers, I have the best followers because in all my like years doing this, I've had maybe three or four comments on video comments that I've had to get rid of because they've been written by trolls. And in chat, one or two people that I've had to deal with other than that. You guys are awesome. I never have problems with you lot. Yes, welcome, welcome. Do come and join in the live chat. If you want to ask me a question, uh, I've got the chat here on my iPad right in front of me. But if you want to get my attention, you can put your comment in big fat capital letters. I have a chance of seeing it. Then I'll be down here painting, but I've got the iPad here. Uh, if you want to make sure you really get my attention, you can do the uh, super chat option, which is a little button, a little dollar symbol at the bottom of the chat window. You can do super chat or super stickers. Uh, either of those way, you get a little coloured box in the chat window that I can't possibly miss. And up here, there'll be a little animate. Not, not there, because that's Guthorn, but up here somewhere, there'll be a little animation and the text will pop up and your message will pop up on screen. The whole world can see it. So if you want to catch my attention, do a super chat or a super sticker. Uh, but if you can't get access to the chat at all, don't worry, you can send me an email if you want. I might not pick it up during the stream because it's on my phone and I'll probably ignore it. But you can if you want, uh, send me an email. My email address is always on screen. It's here, fox at modelmakingguru.com. As always, I've got the stream boss battle going. If you're not sure what that is, you all know what that is. Basically, Simon Reynolds, Simon Reynolds, Kev, uh, our Lord and Saviour Kevin is the current stream boss. Uh, he starts off with 100,000 health. You need to get him down to zero by doing tips and super chats. Super chats I've just explained. Tips you can put through in the tip jar, streamlabs.com forward slash model making guru. And every tip and su tip, oh, steady, steady tip. Careful now. Every tip and super chat, nearly said a rude word then. Every tip and super chat takes a bit of Kevin's health off. The more you put through as a tip or a super chat, the more health comes off. And if you get his health to zero, you win all the money raised through the tips and super chats. And that could be up to 500 quid. You basically win Games Workshop kits or Forge World kits or stuff from Goblin Gaming, if you're in the EU or the UK, up to the value of whatever you win, the pot that you win. And that can be when Simon won, he won 499 quid. So get your tips and super chats coming through. You get his health down to zero. Currently, he is on... 77,435. 
So there you go. So that's all the usual preamble out of the way. I'm going to take my, my big fat heat holder sock. I've got some heat holder socks on because it was cold this morning. Now I've got them on and it was quite nice in here, but I've had to close the window because of annoying middle class neighbours doing power tool stuff. So I've had to close the window so it's getting warm again. So I've taken them off now. So yes, hopefully you can see and uh, hear me. Okay. Because so Streamlabs tends to... Oh, it's, it's back now. The volume thing's working now. So uh, do let me know if my volume is a little bit too loud. I'll turn it down a little bit. There is a bit of red bar clipping there, so it might be a little bit too loud. Do let me know. I'll have a quick look and see who is in chat, and then we'll crack on. So we've got uh, first person I've got in chat here, although may not have been the first all over, it was uh, Snowman HFC. Hello. Babe, Babe Master X says, hello. I'm just going to look because I'm doing schoolwork. Very good of you. Do your schoolwork. Um... Thy creator is in, he says, same, doing school work is prepping for exams. I say he, it could be a she. You all, half of you could be she's or he's, I don't know, because half of you, I don't know, because of your names. You've got non-generic, uh, what's the word, non-gendered names, so I don't know. Uh, so if you're a he and I say she, or if you're a she and I say he, I do apologise. Uh, thy creator, uh, yeah, baby Lib master says, oh God, exams, I have an entrance test to my country's national university next weekend, and thy creator says, oof, yeah, good luck with all your educational stuff. Uh, Mark Shearer is in. He says, hopefully it's a fun stream today. Sadly, I have to go to work. Good day, all. Good day, bro. Have a good day at work, bro. Uh, yes, good. thank you for coming in and saying hello. Enjoy your day at work, hopefully. Hopefully it's a quick um, quick day that goes past really quickly and then you're back home afterwards. Uh, we have a model making guru. Don't know who that is. Quano Man is in. Uh, Daniel Smith is in. Hello to both of you. Uh, average model and no more old people music. There's always old people music. Uh, more Draca 09, evening all, evening dude or dudette. Scott Sutherland, afternoon watching while I make the shiny things at work. Hey, Scott. See, this is also helping Scott, I think, in a lot of ways because, because, like, where Scott works, he's often just sat by himself, just all day, just doing his job. He's very good at his job, uh, what he does. He makes, he makes jewellery. Uh, but yes, he often sat by himself. So we can not only are you keeping me company, you're keeping Scott company and sane as well. That's why he can sit and watch live streams at work because he's on his own. He's just sat there on his Todd. Scott up in Orkney. Uh, Man says, if the software keeps falling over, ban it from alcohol and get it some crutches if it, then it can't fall over. Swigging Pig is in. Afternoon also. Swigging Pig. Swigging Pig. Uh, I met the other day when we went down to E-Models. Me, Ted, Chris, Colin, uh, Tony, uh, and everybody else. And uh, Swigging Pig was there. And he's very kindly become a patron. So I have to say thank you to Swigging Pig. He's one of my newest patrons. He joined the other day. Uh, incidentally, incidentally, uh, there is someone who... Uh, if you if you know my patrons, <clears throat> just in case you are this person is watching, I got a message the other day on on Discord. I have a Patreon exclusive Discord, and somebody joined my Patreon and became a patron. I was like, yeah, brilliant, thank you very much. Um, uh, and what I tend to do is I get the person I get the person details so I can make sure they've got the right access because you have to be a patron to get access to the Patreon Discord. And I said, can you confirm the name that you've registered on Patreon so I can make sure you've got the right access? And he gave me the person had two other names and the name that he'd signed into Discord with, and none of those three names are on Patreon anywhere. So if you are that person you're watching and I contact you, say, can I get your can I get your your details? And I've come back to you and said I can't find. I you, you basically the person gave me two names. I said, what's your name on Patreon? Uh, I've contacted you on the Discord messaging service. Just drop me a message back and give me the name that you're signed up on on Patreon. Because I've basically got lots of new patrons over the last few days, but none of those like user IDs tally with the name on Patreon on the Discord. So I need to get your details so I can make sure you're the right person. You've got the right access. So do let me know. Uh, uh, Mordraka says, I've just found a place in Australia. Australia that sells Gumplet along with God Hand tools. They also send overseas as well. Yes, you do have quite a few stores in uh, Oz that sell Gumplet because you're not that far from the sort of target market of Japan and Asia. So um, you actually have more chance of getting a shop that sells Gumplet there than say we do here <clears throat> in the UK or in big chunks of Europe. Um, so yes, you've actually got reasonable easy access to uh, to Gumplet. You guys, very lucky. What if you win and you're in the US, says Juan Ferreira. Um, if you're in the, this is for the stream boss battle up here. The money that's raised, that goes into a pot. And then I contact you and say, woohoo, if you got, if you got the, the stream boss down to zero, I contact you and say, woohoo, you've won, you've won X amount of pounds. Like I say, it can be anywhere from 200 quid to 500 quid, depending on how much is raised. Uh, basically, if you're in the UK or the EU, you can order. You can all I do then is say, right, what do you want me to order for you? And you go onto the website and you choose what you want, and then I order it for you with your address details. If you're in the EU or the UK, you can order from Games Workshop's website, 
you can order from Forge World website. Uh, it's resin, that's the Forge World stuff. Uh, or you can order from uh, Goblin Gaming. However, Goblin Gaming only shipped to the EU and the UK. So if you're not, if you're outside the EU or outside the UK, you can order from Forge World and from Games Workshop because they send everywhere. Basically, they send to pretty much anywhere in the world. But if you ever, but it's always worth just double checking before you even put anything through as a tip or a super chat to enter this this sort of the uh, the stream boss battle. Just make sure at least if you're outside the UK and the EU, those two places games workshop and forge will actually ship to your destination because there's bound to be one or two places like in the middle of nowhere where they go brilliant i've won oh i can't have it shipped there because the whole point is that um I, I restrict it to those stores so that you can just say what you want i order it those two like games workshop and stuff they offer free shipping over a certain amount so you're probably guaranteed to get free shipping if it was just me ordering like online from a shop and sending it to you you'd get about five quids worth of stuff because the shipping would be massive so yeah, if you're outside the eu or the uk you've still got games workshop and forge world and i forgot to say at the start just before we get going uh, this show is, of course, supported by three bunches of people. First of all, and this whole channel is supported by three lots of people. First of all, my lovely, lovely patrons, my Patreon supporters, without whom I wouldn't have the lights on because they're, they're, the income I get from Patreon uh, is a big chunk of what pays my bills every month and keeps me doing this as my job. This is my this is my living, thanks to the graciousness of my patrons. Um, so a big shout out to all my patrons, including new patrons, Swig and Pig. If you want to help support this channel directly, you can do if you'd be willing to help me out. Um, to keep this channel going i would love it dearly uh, you can do it. it's just patreon.com forward slash model making guru uh, you can you can support me with as little or as much as you like it's entirely up to the basic basic reward steps for different amounts so whatever you would be willing to support me with i would be more than willing to be absolutely in love with you for doing that uh, but also this channel is sponsored by emodels.co.uk your one-stop shop for all your model making needs your traditional model making so cars planes boats trucks war stuff tools equipment all that kind of stuff tons and tons of different ranges of paints they are the uk's biggest leading uh, retailer of tamir products so go and check them out the link is in the description below the video all the stock is reduced rrp for a lot of it, it's like 10 percent off rrp so go and check it out everything is reduced it's some great deals and they've got a good deal section you can check out good cool stuff that's reduced in price and of course for all your all your tabletop based model making needs and gaming needs <clears throat> i'm also supported by goblin gaming uh, again the link is in the description below uh, they offer 20 percent off games workshop malifaux and conflict 47 products 20 percent off rrp off all those ranges and massive percentage savings on everything else that they stock that doesn't come under that 20%. So do go and check them out. The link in the description below the video uh, is an affiliate link, which means if you use that link to or to place your order, I make a little tiny bit of income off that. So if you do go to Goblin Games regularly, or if you think you're gonna use them, don't just go to the website, use that link that's in the description below this video, use that link and that will tell them that you've come through me and they'll give me a little bit of income to say thanks for me bring, sending you to them. So go and check them out. All the links in the description below the video. Uh, let's have a look average model says yes but when i'm at work and you stream i don't have to listen to old people who's oh that's right yes i've got you i've got you uh christopher c says hello all yes and of course if i sit here average model and go my first tank bell part one thank you very much for watching like and subscribe then you start laughing and people look at you as if to say that looks crazy that man's crazy we applaud a crazy man crazy man is laughing at his desk he fired his ass is fired oh I will stop now. I don't know where that voice came from. Anyway, um, yes. So welcome to all. Uh, welcome to Christopher C. Uh, Average modeler says LMAO. Now remember, of course, it's getting really warm and I have to close. I'm going to open the window again, even though there's a noisy neighbour. I'm going to have to open the window. So give me one second. It's too warm and sweaty in here. Hang on. Hang on. Oh, oh, oh. oh blessed relief. The cooling breeze of nature. Oh, oh that's good. That's good, right. So, yeah, there we go. A bit of breeze coming through now. Uh, yes, so, uh, what was I going to say? I have no idea. What was I about to say something? I was going to say something. Uh, average modeler, talking, talking, something, something. Oh, Scott says there's actually four of us in the workshop. Oh, wow. That's like 300% more staff than normal. Uh, I'm just going to, hang on. Making adjustments to my seating area. Uh, okay, so... Scott's got three colleagues today. Yeah, Scott uh, Scott works for a company that makes um, Orcadian jewellery. I will give them a plug. I think the website. Uh, the company is Ortak. O-R-T-A-K. They make uh, handcrafted silverware. Silverware. Handcrafted jewellery. Uh, with Orcadian traditions. They're in Orkney. 
Oops, Scott lives in Orkney. And they make some beautiful stuff. So go and check them out. I think it's autac.co.uk. I could be wrong. But yes, he's often by himself. Bless him. But we'll keep you company anyway, Scott. Stay strong. Optimism, Captain. Right, so anyway, yes. So, plan for today. Uh, if you remember, like I said, we've been working on the yellow armour for the last uh, week or two in these shows. And we were, it was kind of a, a long, drawn-out um, paint job. We had the, the whole thing was primed in a light colour. All the yellow pots were actually originally primed in Mephiston Red Rattle Cam Primer because I didn't want to, I wanted to use a not too dark colour. Uh, they were first of all painted in Avalanche Sunset. They were then given a wash of, if I can get it from over here, they were given a wash of Agrax Earthshade to darken them down. They were then given a dry brush of Avalanche Sunset to bring up the yellow back into the main raised areas, but in the recesses keep them dark. Then they were given a dry brush of Uriel Yellow and a dry brush, a very slight dry brush of Phalanx Yellow. It's the, basically the Games Workshop process, <clears throat> you know, base, shade, layer, layer. But it was done with dry brushing instead. I need to clear my throat one second. So it was done with dry brushing instead. And the entire point was to create a post shading effect. I'll get a bit of yellow armor for you to see. Let me find a big bit. Have I got a big? No, I haven't got a big bit. Have I? Uh, well, you can see here, hopefully. Uh, it was to create a post shading effect, which might not come out on camera. But it, and it, again, remember the colors on camera aren't quite I'm, I'll zoom in a bit for you uh, the colors on your telly screen won't quite be correct because the color balance on webcams is never quite right but you can see there we've got this nice pre sh uh, post shading effect because I wasn't using airbrushes <clears throat> I wasn't doing a pre shade effect but I wanted to get that I wasn't doing pre shading but I wanted to get a pre shade effect with some variation so that's been done with dry brushing all those yellows now because I used so much, so many different colours, and it was a lot of dry brushing, <clears throat> it has come out with a very interesting texture. Because with dry brushing, there's only so far you can go before you've gone too far. Uh, when you dry brush, you make a very, it's not the smoothest of paint coats, like an airbrush coat, you get the, the very slightest of textures. And then when you dry brush over that, <clears throat> of course a dry brush picks up edges and highlights them you're kind of making those edges stand out and then you do a dry brush on top of that one and you're compounding it over and over so eventually you will start to get a very textured surface now it has come out with a texture on here now you probably can't see it on camera but it's kind of interesting because it has this sort of how can I explain, almost like a leather kind of iron cast iron kind of very slight texture to it now once obviously everything's finished and before we do any chipping and stuff and decals i'm actually going to give them a light sand to smooth them down a bit um, but it will still have this slight you can see it in the colors as well because some bits like a little sort of speckly effect it's it's almost like perhaps maybe tank armor or tank armor or something like that in world war ii tanks so i was quite at first i'm like oh it's ruined now i've got this brushy texture to it not brush marks but I wasn't happy. Uh, but now I've done a little bit of dry brushing of the red. I'm actually quite happy because it's it's only the yellow that's going to have that. Because the red we're doing a simpler process and it won't have a chance to do that. Uh, and it just makes it interesting because once it's got the you know matte varnish and stuff on it. It'll look kind of interesting with this ever so slight grainy texture to it. And we'll have the outlining and all the chipping and stuff. So it will fade away. But it helps go towards the, the final look of this. Which if you remember I've explained is a Borderlands style uh, watercolour and ink style look it's going to have um the kind of watercolor the paint's going to have a kind of watercolory feel to it even though it's not watercolors and we're going to have <clears throat> ink outlines on everything just like in the borderlands 2 not borderlands 3 because that doesn't that's a bit more fussy and a bit less watercolory but borderlands 2 where there's no actual metallics and everything's kind of watercolory so that's what we're going to go for but because the reds are going to be simpler they're not going to have that texture so that's all the yellow parts are done i'm going to zoom back out again oops or zoom in even there we go <clears throat> so yes, yeah, so the the yellows come out a little bit texture, and I was a bit a bit depressed about that the, the last couple of days. I'm like, oh, I've ruined it now, I've ruined everything. But then I did a test on the red, and here's what we're aiming for with the reds. Uh, this is what we're aiming for with the red dry brushing. It's this effect. Now, if you're not sure, uh, what we've what I've got so far is all the red armor here. This has had a shade of Agrax Earth shade, same as the yellow. I did them all at the same time. So the, so far, that's red primer. It's Mephiston red primer. Bear in mind there were like 23 different colours for the yellow. It's Mephiston red primer and a wash of Agrax Earthshade. 
and then that's what we're actually aiming for. It's not that much different. You may not even see a massive difference on your telly screen. This is what the final thing should look like. This is just after a coat of Agrax Earth Shade. What I'm basically doing is, so it's Mephiston Red Primer. So the primer is the base color. There's nothing wrong with doing that at all. If your primer is the color you want, that's why colored primers are fantastic. Uh, the red Mephiston Red Primer, Rattle Candon, nice and smooth, a wash of Agrax Earth Shade. Uh, and then, instead of going back with the Mephiston Red, we want it to be a light color, so there's no point adding more Mephiston Red, it's just gonna get more complicated. We do a dry brush of Evil Sun Scarlet, and then a very light dry brush of squig orange, Simon it like that, squig orange, just in some of the smaller middle center areas and on some of the edges. And we get this nice subtle difference. It's not massive difference, but it's there, it's subtle. It's got a kind of Charles Zaku look, just subtle enough, because the, the Agrax Serge darkens down the Mephiston Red, which if you look at Mephiston Red, compared to say Evil Sun Scarlet, is a little bit lighter and uh, darker anyway. So, but because we've only done a bit of dry brushing of that and a little bit, tiny bit of that, there's less dry brushing happened, so it's not got that texture to it. So once that's been uh, matte varnish, it's had weathering on it, that will just look like it, that may as well have been airbrushed. Once that's been matte varnish, you won't know that hasn't been airbrushed. Whereas the yellow things, you'll know that's not been airbrushed because it's got this texture. But after a while, I kind of grew to like it. It's got a nice kind of grainy texture, like perhaps the metal on the mech is grainy. It's got a texture to it. So that's what we're going for, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, if you're not sure what this project is, if you've not been watching the previous shows, uh, this is, like I said before, a Patreon reward build. Uh, my top tier patrons, $100 a month plus, um, get a, as, as well as I can do it, as professional as I can do it, a full build and paint model free of charge after 12 months of support. Um, it was Gumpler, but now it's, it's changed to Warhammer now, just for the sake of my sanity, but it was Gumpler. Uh, but this is for George. He's one of my top tier patrons. Uh, and I'm building for him the Master Grade Sazabi, but with a tweet, with a twist. First of all, he's a massive, massive uh, Shanghai Dragons Overwatch supporter. He, he supports Shanghai Dragons, the Overwatch esports team. And he loves those guys, so it's going to be in their livery, in their colour scheme. And it's also going to be, because when we when we arranged all this, they weren't a very good team. It was going to be battered and beaten and weathered. So then I thought, well, why don't we do it in a Borderlands colour scheme? Because it, I like the, the style, because that's always battered and beaten. And it'll make it look more interesting than just a red and yellow Cesar. Because at the moment, with just red and yellow, it's rocking an Iron Man vibe. And it just happens to look a bit like I. It's rocking an Iron Man vibe. So with Shanghai Dragons being red and yellow, it would just look like Iron Man. But put a Borderlands paint job on it. Oh, so yeah, we're doing that. So it's a it's a Ver Shanghai Dragons versus Ar uh, Ver Borderlands. But it's not just going to be the mobile suit. We're going to have a little diorama. I've got a figure to go with it. I've got uh, one of those one twentieth scale figures from I think it's Kiri Yamato from the old No Grade kits, the old uh, pre Master Grade No Grade kits. Uh, and we're going to. Add a figure to that little tiny very simple diorama to go with it so well, by the time it's finished it hopefully should look fantastic i was quite glum about that texture on the yellow paint but i've got around that now it, it works in my mind so I'm, I'm optimistic again i'm gonna get off the get on the gloves of not ruining the paint job i don't need to put these on but i'd rather put them on just to protect it again this isn't a bill for me this is a bill for for a somebody else so i shall make the most effort i've got the tickly nose as always Ooh. whenever i turn the camera on and the lights on two things my nose goes sniffly and all the hairs at the top of my moustache go and point upwards and tickle my nostrils it's most annoying doesn't happen when the camera's not on <sighs> let's have a look uh that's who's come in uh Yep, you got that right, Fox. Thanks for the plug. Yeah, it's uh, ortak.co.uk. O-R-T-A-K. Uh, fine, fine Orcadian jewellery, handmade by people with hands, uh, in their hands. Uh, Scott makes lovely, lovely things, including puffins and many other dragons and all kinds of Celtic stuff. Lots of beautiful uh, jewellery. Go and check them out. Give me your money. It's a, it's an Orcadian business. It's only, Orkney's only about three miles square. There's only five people that live in Orkney, so you're supporting the entire country or the entire island. It's not, that's not quite true, I know. Uh, so look, looks like someone had lengthened Iron Man's face. Yeah, that's why, as soon as I put that bit together, I'm like, it looks like Iron Man. That's why I'm glad I chose the Borderlands paint scheme. Uh, Pinero or P Nero says, kinda. I don't know kind of to what, what that's a response to, but kinda. Unless he means it kind of looks like Iron Man. Yeah, kind of a little bit looks like Iron Man. Uh, 
I'm just adjusting this clamp because it's coming off. Uh, Lynn Dipple says, Heidi peeps, I'm here. Hey, Lynn. Welcome, welcome. I'm guessing it's either after work, before work, or a day off today, so welcome. Uh, P. Nero says, better than doing a film, full metal look on the frame. Oh, Beyblade Mass says, I like the colour of the frame underneath. Yeah, because it's the Borderlands colour style, uh, it looks a bit weird now, but when it gets the outlines on there, you'll see, because it's a Borderlands style, if you look at, not necessarily Borderlands 3, but in Borderlands 1 and 2, there are no actual metallic colours. All the metallic things, like um, frames for the uh, Hyperion loaders, and any metalwork that's exposed on some of the vehicles and buildings, it's all just greys, it's not there's no shiny metallics. So I decided what I'd do is I'd do that kind of effect on the interior frames. The interior frame is a mixture of darker greys uh, and some of these light colours. And these are just contrast paints. It's the, the Citadel contrast paints. It's the grey sear primer. And then I went over with either Space Wolves grey or Griff Charger grey uh, with maybe one or two coats just to get this grey effect. And it, once it's got the outlines on there and a couple of little bits of tidy up here and there, it'll kind of have that, hopefully, it'll kind of have that Borderlands look. So, fingers crossed, hopefully. Right. Uh, looking good, Fox, says Lynn. Thank you very much. Lynn Dipple says, Hi, Scott. I still got the Taminori necklace. Loving it. Yes, I'm off two days. Yay. For those that don't know, a Taminori is a Puffin. Taminori is the Acadian name for Puffin. Taminori. Right, so we're going to do some red. So we're going to start with Evil Sun Scarlet. So it's Mephiston Red and Agrax Earthshade over the top. Just one coat of Agrax. Mephiston Red is quite a dark red colour. I'm surprised Dad hasn't suddenly burst in like Batman through the skylight when I said Mephiston Red, but there you go. So we're going to start off with a dry brush. Uh, now, one of the other reasons I think that I got a texture on the yellow was because I was using a very sele varied selection of dry brushing brushes, including some of the Citadel dry brushes, but also including some of the Citadel base brushes. Uh, and I've got some of the old, some, some old base brushes here. Now these are really good for small areas, but I think the problem I was having is that I was dry brushing with some of these, and these are a bit rougher, because they're base brushes, than the dry brushes, which are a bit softer. So I think because I was using this, that's where a little bit of the texture came in. And as I added more coats of paint dry brushed over the top, it kind of picked out those little raised textures. And it just made it compounded itself. So I'm going to not use any of those base brushes. I'm going to use just the dry brushes. Uh, I've got the Citadel medium dry brush. I've got a Army Painter large dry brush, which I think also puts a little bit of texture a little bit because it's a bit stiffer. And I've got this big fat massive dry brush, but I might not use that. And I've got a, a base brush. These base brushes, they do make really nice little dry brushes if you're doing little circular dry brushing like me for the shading effect. So, so yeah. So I'm going to start with anyway, the uh, Evil Sun Scarlet. We will go in. I've got to do the big area. I've got one. Well, I'm going to use the medium dry brush for the Evil Sun Scarlet because it's the majority of this is going to be dry brushed. And then for the smaller areas where I'm using the Squig Orange, I'm going to use that smaller Army Painter one. So you've seen dry brushing before. Chris is in. Hello, all. Have I missed anything? Hey, Chris. Uh, no, you not missed anything, dude. I'm just about to start doing graph now, doing reds today. So I don't need a lot of paint on there, just a tiny amount. You know how dry brushing works. You've seen me do it a batrillion times. I need my headset of seeing, a space helmet of seeing. So I hope everyone is okay today. This is what we're going to be doing now. So really, quite simply, I've got itchy nose again. Oh, God damn it. Uh, just quite simply working in the center of panels. Now, because with the yellow, we had to, I had to do a lot of the re-dry brushing of the, of the Avalanche Sunset because I was covering up a lot of the darker area that had been shaded with the, the Agrax Earth Shade to bring it back. Of course, with this, I'm not having to do quite that much because I'm starting with only, I'm only having two highlight colours. So the advantage is I don't need to worry so much about being either careful or getting a large area covered. I can just focus on the, the middle parts of the panel. So I've kind of almost missed out one step. So hopefully it should be a lot quicker than doing it when I did the yellows because that took forever. So this, because there's less of it, should be a bit quicker. So I can just roughly go into the middle of panels because the dark and red isn't that much darker anyway. Evil Sun Scarlet is not massively brighter than Mephiston Red. I mean, it is. If you, if you, if you just did a coat of Mephiston Red and then painted all the edges with Evil Suns, you'd see it. But when you're dry brushing it, it's not 
massive if you're building up the color change slowly it's not a massive difference so we'll try and just build it up there's like little little circles inside the center of panels and if it looks it looks a bit stark sometimes that you've got like the dark area and then a sudden blob of red that's fine we've got chipping and stuff to come on top so i'm not too fussed i'm going to pick out these edges proper dry brush style uh, because it's a slatted surface so it deserves some some redness some highlight edgy highlightiness it's really warm in here now it's really warm so how is everybody i hope you're all well uh, i hope you're all having a good day today whether you're uh, at work or at school or if you've got a day off for whatever reason hopefully you're not off from work or school because you're poorly sick because that would suck so I don't want that to be the reason. But hopefully you're having a good day today. As always, uh, Dad's not here. So, I shall ask Chris to ask the question. Chris, Chris at Gross Models is your uh, one of your mods today. Chris is in. He's a lovely little fella. We always say he's dead little, but he's not. He's the same height as all of us. Uh, Chris is a lovely guy. He's your mod today uh, at the moment. So, uh, yeah. Ask the question, Chris. Chris says, I still have the lurgy. It's okay if I don't move. Oh, yeah, Chris. I forgot Chris has got a cold because he's feeble. Chris has picked up a cold from somewhere. He was a bit snuffly last night. He didn't do a lot of speaking last night on the e-model show. Chris, you know the question. It's Dad's question. It's the only question Dad asks. There we go. Belly and bench. Yes. Thank you, Chris. Yes. Yeah, so, as always, uh, what is on the on your bench? What are you working on? And what's in your belly? What are you planning for dinner? Or what have you had for your dinner, depending on where you are in the world, in the big world? What's on your belly? What's in your bench? That's not the right way around. Okay, so we've done that coat there. Uh, I'm not going to do both of the coats. I'm going to slowly go through and do the Evil Sun Scarlet first and then come back in with the Squig Orange second. So I'm not going to do... I might not get all of the Evil Sun Scarlet done today. We'll see how it goes. Uh, that creates but if you mess with him, he'll break you in half. Yes. Chris is a lovely fella. He's a lovely guy. He'll look after you in chat. You are his family, but if you mess with him, he'll snap you in half and feed you to the wolves. Now, don't forget, of course, uh, this is this show is nothing to do with my channel sponsors e models. So uh, I don't care. It's not necessarily family friendly, although it is monetized. So I'm not going to swear, but I don't mind if you guys do rude words in chat. You're more than you're all grown up. You're more than allowed to swear in chat. Don't worry about it. I won't read it out, but there you go. Now you can see here, I'm getting a bit of a patchy texture on the, not a patchy texture, but a patchy look on the red paint. But it's not a texture that I'm getting. It's just like you can see little bright bits and dark bits. It's not an even fade. It's not a soft fade from one to the other. Um, and that's perfect because, as I say, this is going to be the Borderland style. It's going to have that kind of patchy watercolour effect, hopefully, at the end of it. So all the base colours, I don't want things to be red or yellow. I want them to be splotchy red with splotches of lighter red here and there and darker red here and there and uneven. Because there will be chipping and stuff going on the top as well. And that will all just make it look more blended in. Now, keep in mind, of course, uh, I've changed the scale on this. In real life, if you like real life, the Cesarbe is like what a 20, 30 meter tall mobile suit. So for things like chipping and weathering and shading and things, you'd have a totally different sense of scale. But for this build, I'm building it as because it's an Overwatch uh, build because it's for Shanghai Dragons. I'm building it to be like Diva's mech from Overwatch. So it's not meant to be, a, a you know, 20 or 30 meter tall mobile so it's meant to be a 20 foot tall mech uh, to give you an idea of scale let me get the figure the figure that's going to be stood next to it is that and that's the that's one of the skirt that's the side skirt so you can see it changes my scale so when it comes to painting all this and doing the weathering and chipping and all this kind of dry brushing i'm working in a 20 foot tall scale because you remember I always say, uh, whenever you're doing any kind of weathering or planning your paint job, keep in the back of your mind how big a human hand would be compared to the thing you're working on. 
that gives you your scale. So if you're painting paint chips, you know, paint chips are very rarely bigger than human hand. So use use that human hand as your scale. So for this, I could when I get around to chipping, I can do quite big paint chips. Uh, and I can do lots and lots of tiny paint chips. Whereas if it was supposed to be like an actual Sazabi, like 30 meters tall, I'd have to be a bit more restrained because paint chips wouldn't be that big and a lot of them wouldn't even be visible at that scale. So yeah, keep that in mind. Now you can see there I've got a bit too much paint on the brush. So I've got that nice clean streak there. That's fine, that works. It works for me because it looks like say on the back of a van where you've got loads of road grime and somebody's wiped it off. It kind of has that look, that works for me. It's all random, happy accidents. You don't want everything to look the same. You want to just get on with the painting, don't think. And what happens will happen and you make of that what you can. Uh, ooh, Soup Cat says Skullfish. Soup Cat, thank you very much Skullfish, that's very kind of you. That's two pounds in as a little super chat. Uh, which means that's a little bit of Simon's health has come off, yes. Getting him closer. Thank you very much, Skullfish. Soup Cat. Where's that come? We just, I'm sure we came. That's we, that's the reference to something that I've already forgotten what it was. Soup Cat. Skullfish. Or oh, is it something I said last night on the show? Soup Cat. Dad says, Don't oh, just got in and seen it was on. Can you start again, Fox? Uh, does that mean I've got to go backwards? I can't go backwards. Hi, Dad. Uh, but yes, we already asked the question. You were, you'd snoozed and you lose. You snoozed and you lose. That's not how it works. I know. So I'm just going to put a bit more. We're doing red, Dad. You may have noticed. A bit more evil suns in the centre of these panels. So you can see, again, yeah, okay, I don't know if it'll come out on camera and if I can stop dropping it. Uh, and it's still a bit wet and shiny, but once it's matte varnished, we've now basically got a, the lighter patch down the middle and the darker red is around the panel line and the edges. Now, it looks a bit obvious, but that's fine. Like I say, once we put chipping and stuff on there and everything else, it will just look fine. The trick of doing anything like this um, is not really to think about it. If you want to get... A kind, whatever whatever process you are in the middle of doing if you want to get a kind of natural look let's turn this paper over if you want to get a kind of natural weathering whether you're doing paint chipping with chipping fluids whether you're doing adding rust or you're just like dirt and dust and grime or mud whatever you're actually doing the best thing you can do is don't overthink it i mean Obviously, have an understanding of how the technique you're doing works. If you're doing, say, chipping fluids or uh, if you're doing, say, streaking grimes or something like that, or if you're painting on paint chips, have a, a basic understanding of the thing you're doing. So, for example, say you're adding rust, you kind of want to know what would be likely to rust. Like, if I'm making a car that's got, say, a fiberglass body, I'm not really going to be putting much rust on that because it's fiberglass. But if I'm making a U-boat, it'll obviously have lots of rust above the waterline, but no real rust below the waterline, much less rust. So it's have a working knowledge, a working knowledge of, of, of you know, the process that you're trying to recreate. Don't just go, yay, rust, or whatever you're putting on. You know, have a, an understanding of how that actually occurs in real life. But then get your stuff on your brush and just go for it. Don't think about it. Um, because that... In real life, things like rust and chipping and dirt and grime and things, they don't, they're not carefully planned. They're just random, random ass stuff. So don't think about it. Just go straight in, get doing stuff. Uh, you'll probably have lots of little happy accidents where, for example, like I'm doing, you know, on some of these bits, I've got maybe too much paint on the brush and it comes out quite bright. That's fine. I can build that into the weathering later on. Uh, you know, if you're doing paint chipping after this, I've got a bit where perhaps I've got a big blob of the light colour paint. It's not really working. I can cover it with a paint chip. So don't really think about it. Just just get in there. Like I say, understand the process you're trying to recreate so that at least the person looking at the model, at least what you do, it fools the eye into thinking it, it's recreating a process. Like I say, it's the whole thing about paint chips not bigger than a human hand. If you make a model and you cover it in paint chips that will be about the size of a six foot man, 
that's not how paint chips work that's not how paint being chipped off a surface actually works it would look weird your brain would be like that's not quite right that's not quite right something's not right there uh, is fox going to keep saying the r word should someone get down a drip oh yeah drip tray of the dribblies <laughs> yeah so just have a basic understanding of the process you want to achieve and just go into autopilot don't think about it too much like here I you know I could be very very careful get a really small brush and do lots of little delicate highlights and things because this is an alternative to airbrush pre-shading so I could be all careful and think well this bit should be that color and this bit no I'm not doing that I'm just getting this big ass brush and I'm just gently dry brushing into some of the center of panels and dropping things of course center of panels now you can also see here, and maybe you can see on camera, I've got two bits where some of the Agrax Earth shade pulled up and I've got like a brown spot. Again, I'm not fussing about that. I've gone over it a bit with the dry brush, it's faded it. I'll have chipping to do later on and I can build that into the chipping. I can either, um, you know, put paint chips over it or I can have it make it into a darker chip or even I could leave it as it is and just draw ink outlines around it and put some cross hatching in it because we're doing the ink outline. So don't don't worry about stuff. Just go for it. It, it takes a little practice and a little while to get comfortable, to get just naturally able to just black things on and not think and not have them come out like really bad. And there will be times when you just go in randomly and not think and something doesn't quite work out and you're like, arse magnets. Um, but the worst thing that what's the worst that can happen? The worst thing that can happen is that if, if a part gets painted and it looks terrible, just strip it and start again. It's not the end of the world especially if you're just building for yourself like this like i say is, is it's not a commission but it's a build for somebody else so i've got to be careful i've got to be a bit more deliberate and thoughtful about this but uh you know if i screw something up i may have to strip it and start again but if you're doing it just for yourself it's just your own build if you screw something up you could work weathering around it you could strip it and start again you could say well that bit went wrong so i'm just going to put a massive great paint chip there and make it look like it's got a big impact things like that you can do whatever you want or you could just abandon it and start something else for example classic example of adapting as things change i was doing my master grade freedom gundam and uh, i've mentioned this before but what i did was i did a, a gloss coat before the decals of the pledge two times more shine floor care finish and it all went well the decals went on no problems but i'd used too much of the microsol and microset uh and i splashed it all over i got it all over this this part to put the decal on since then i've actually learned just to use the microsol and microset more more locally more targeted not just to put it everywhere i've been quite liberal with it and splashed it all over the place henry cooper would have been proud uh but because i've done quite a lot of it it had actually eaten into the gloss coat a little bit just a little tiny bit and when i did a gunk wash later on with some oil paints and wiped all the oil paint off the oil paint came off quite easily on the gloss coat that was unaffected but the gloss coat that had been sort of affected by the microsol and microset it had kind of eaten in and scored it a little bit so it had a very slight pitted texture uh, the the oil paint didn't come out it left a dark stain in like a ring shape around this decal where the the gloss coat had been eaten away a little bit by the decal solutions so i was like oh. there was no way to real fix to really fix it i didn't have any options to fix it i didn't have anything ammonia based to take the gloss coat off um and that might affect the decal anyway because the gloss coat was underneath and on top of the decal i was like oh uh, i couldn't replace the decals because they were custom made so it's like oh, right what i'm going to do now so in a, in a moment of thinking because only a bill for me it was only a bill i was i sold it but you know it was still only a bill for myself what i decided was you know what let's work it let's make a work around instead of panicking and getting all stressed out and abandoning the model all i did was i got some some starship felt oil paint and i a mixture of painting and dry brushing and stippling i created a blast mark like a scorch mark uh, so it's like a you know, like when something gets hit and you go and you get like a splat mark and then the scorching go off the side i did that just with some starship filth made a little sort of something impacted and went on the surface made a little scorch mark that meant something hit it and pinged off that way 
and I had this little tiny scorch mark which looked like an impact, a hot impact, and it covered up that mess completely. And it just looked like a bit of battle damage. And it worked out perfectly. And in the end, it looked fantastic. I'm like, that's, that's awesome. I done. And going forward, after I'd done that, I kind of used that technique again in future builds. Not where I'd messed up gloss coats, but I knew that was always an option. But it was more just, sometimes I'd use that just to add a, a similar kind of blast scorch mark because it looked pretty good. So I was quite pleased with that. So yeah, you can always adapt. You can always adapt. Uh, let's have a look. Lynn Dipple says, hi, Mama Fox. Hope you are well. Uh, yeah, she's feeling a bit... Mama Fox hasn't been well for the last few days. She was better yesterday. She's still a bit uh, poorly tummy at the moment. So um, she'll be fine now. I'm sure she'll be fine. But thank you, Lynn. Uh, I'll have a look at chat in a moment. So yeah, you can always, you can in a lot of times, you can always recover something. That's the that's why I don't do, I've said this before, that's why I don't do clean, unweathered builds. Because if you're making a nice, shiny sports car or a nice, shiny fighter plane, and there's no weathering on it at all, if you screw something up, you either start from scratch, you abandon the kit, or you just, it's just sadness. If I'm making a nice, shiny, say, for, Formula One car or a sports car, and I, you know, do something wrong with the paint job, that's it. I've got to strip that paint off the body shell and start again. Uh, if you're doing a weathered model that's got maybe battle damage or just normal weathering, not a problem. You mess up the paint somewhere, you just cover it up with weathering. That's the whole point. Because weathering, you don't think about it, but sometimes you may have to just deliberately put some weathering in a certain position. Like I might just put a rust spot here because it covers up a thumbprint or something like that. Uh, like the paint on those yellow pots, like I said, it has a slight texture to it. And at first, I was quite depressed about that, but then I realised I can I can tone it down a little bit by just very gently sanding over it, and it smooths it ever so slightly. But what it leaves behind is this nice kind of textured effect that actually works quite well, and it will set the red from the yellow and make them look a bit different. So there's always something you can do. It's very rare that you'll have to just like abandon a kit because it's. I mean, it does happen. It does happen. You know, you, you may at some point have a kit where you just like have to go, you know, I'm going to walk away from this because it's just gone off the rails now. There's nothing I can do about that. But that's not the end of the world. At the end of the day, if you're not doing a commission, if you're just doing it for yourself, at the end of the day, it's just a bit of plastic. Hopefully it's just something you spent maybe 30 or 40 quid on. Yeah, it's a shame to have to throw it away. But at the end of the day, ultimately, when you run out of tissue paper, uh, at the end of the day, if you if you throw it away, or just put it back in the box and maybe think about it some other time. It's fine. Because you know what will happen? Within a week, you'll be working on something else. And after a while, you'll have forgotten all about it. I've got a little resin Reliant, a USS Reliant, in a box somewhere. That I started painting years and years ago. started painting before I had an airbrush. Uh, it kind of looked like absolute gash. So I, I put it away in the box many years found it in the attic got it out of the box it was a resin kit so all the nacelles had fallen off because the super glue i didn't know about pinning so all the super glue had just died um well it was many years in the attic all the things had fallen off and then i was like oh i stripped it back and was like should we give it another go but this time with the airbrush but i wasn't feeling it so i just gave up and threw it away i put it back in the box i should say i've still got it somewhere so yeah there's never nothing wrong and bad about just abandoning a build like I said, unless it's a build for someone else, in which case you're kind of beholden to them to finish it. Uh, and that's where you get a bit creative with covering up your sins. Or, you know, if it's a commission or something like that. But ultimately, if you're just doing it for yourself, it doesn't matter. If a kit goes wrong and it's not an expensive kit, strip it down, use it as a test pig. Because even if a kit goes horrendously wrong and it's terrible, you'll still have learned something in the process. You'll still have learned, you'll know what you've done. You think, well, I tried this and it totally didn't work. So you'll always learn something. There we go. That's that bit there. Now what I'm going to do, I can start to feel a slight texture coming in on this. So what I'm going to do is I think I've got crusted up paint on the brush. Because you get that after a little while. So what I'm going to do is rinse the brush off. 
Not properly, but just give it a good rinse. Just to dislodge any chunks of paint. Because sometimes you might get a texture because some of the paint's dried out and now you've got a rough paintbrush. Whereas when you started you had a soft dry brush and I've got a rough paintbrush. And I've got to tell you, by the way, when you're doing reds or yellows and you're dry brushing like this, like I did for the last few episodes, trying to get all the yellow out of those brushes, Jesus Christ, that was a pain in the backside. I don't think, I was, I, like, I cleaned I cleaned the brush and I got it in the warm water and I used my brush cleaning soap and I did it over and over and over and over again. The brush looked clean, put it in some isopropyl alcohol, yellow, wow. Yeah, it, you'll be cleaning your brush for days. So don't worry about, if it's a dry brushing brush, don't worry about getting all the, paint out i'm just getting i've got a piece of tissue over here by the way that i'm getting the, doing the brush on so I'll put that there get some more tissue where is my tissue tissue oh for some reason when t when you pull kitchen roll off and it does that it just really triggers me i don't know why i have to just throw the whole piece away now i don't know why it bugs me so what i'm gonna do i'm gonna leave that for a second uh, i'm gonna have a quick look at the chat and then when we've done with the chat i'll give that a hair dryer and then we'll carry on Uh, let's have a look. Fox said red, says Lynn. Yet yeah, that doing red is what some and dad says. Uh, Chris at Chris Model. Schoolfish came in. Schoolfish. But we all know that because he's put some money through early. Uh, Lynn Dipple says to Scott, cool, I will check those out. I think I missed that conversation. Not thinking it's Fox's superpower. It is. My superpower is not thinking. Uh, Tals are on the way, Dad, so you can wipe the dribblies when Fox says the R word. More Draca says, so a Ted moment there, Fox. I've already forgotten what I was said, so uh, I don't know. What was I talking about? This is a problem with live streams where you can't read the chat constantly. Like the E-Model show that me, Ted and Chris do, we're constantly reading the chat as best we can. So, we can, But when you're doing your own stream and I spend 10 minutes doing something, and I, I, I don't know what I say five minutes later, so I've got no idea what that was a response to. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, can you tell us what was in the Mama Fox delivery box? Asks Chris. Oh, uh, yeah, she had a big parcel turn up yesterday. It was a plant pot. <laughs> it was a self watering plant pot. It's basically a big plant pot with like a little area at the bottom, like with some sticky up bits inside, and a bit at the bottom that fills it with water, a tube that comes out, and a little thing that the water goes in. And it's just, it holds like four litres of water, so it constantly keeps the soil moist. But then she's going to put it outside with some plants in it, and I'm like, so the whole self-watering bit, not really that important when it's going to be outside in the rain. Bless her. Uh, she's also got a spider catcher coming, but that's not turned up yet. I today received, yes, my uh, pot of brush cleaner and preserver. Dad gave me that, so I've got this one as well. I actually prefer this shape and size. I don't know why. But this one for, hang on. Oh, I love that smell. Well, it might just be the other pot, because this one's actually lathering up okay, but the last pot had this size. It just didn't lather up at all. But this one is. Then maybe it was just my pot of it wasn't very good. But I've got some of that. It's got more of that. Uh, in my Amazon store. This is in my Amazon store, by the way. Um, however, at the moment, I'm, this comes from the US. So it takes about a week to get to you. It doesn't cost a fortune. It's only about five, six dollars. But I'm trying to find somewhere on Amazon UK base that sells this for people in the UK. But uh, if not, don't worry, it's only like six or seven quid to buy it and the shipping's like two or three quid. So it's fine. It'll last you for a month or two anyway. Uh, ba -ba -da. Lynn Dibble says, Barrett, back, got to register for class for work. I got Fox on the big screen. Yay! Is that Evil Sun Scarlet, says Fox? Yes, we have. Based in Mephiston Red. Dad's just gone a bit jiggly. Based in Mephiston Red, it's had a single coat of Agrax Earthshade. And then I'm going to dry brush it with Evil Sun Scarlet. And then do a little tiny dry brush in the centre of the panels with Squig Orange. So what should come out at the end is that, that effect. Which you can't really see because it's still got the shinies from the shade, but it's that kind of pre it's not going to be as intensely pre shaded or post shaded as the yellow parts. The yellow parts end up with a texture on them. These are going to be nice and smooth. It's, it's just very subtle compared. It's a, a few less steps than the yellow, so it should also be a bit quicker as well. Uh, oh, slapping the fluids on for the decals. Oh, yes, yes, I had a Ted moment there. Oh, I don't have squig orange yet. It's that colour. Uh, I was I was looking for because basically if you've seen when I did the yellow on my um, Bandit Raider 
Bandit Technical, which is the Ridge Runner, the Achilles Ridge Runner. Uh, I had the same yellows I've used, which is Avalanche Sunset, and then Uriel Yellow, and a bit of dry brush of uh, Phalanx Yellow. And then the chipping was Dawn Yellow, which was a very bright, pastel lemony yellow. Uh, that was put over the top and it had this wonderful chipping effect, borderlands effect. I'm going to do the same on the red. So I've got the Mephiston red, the Evil Suns for the sort of highlighty area, this stuff for the, the sort of very subtle highlights. And then for the for the chips, I've actually got some full grim pink. Now this might be a bit too pink. I don't know yet. I'm going to have to try it out because I actually apply it for quite thin. So we'll see what this looks like. I was trying to get, in the same way that was like the yellow chip colour, this is going to be the red chip colour. And it's not the main chip colour because it'll be a chip of this and then in the middle of it I'll paint a chip of say Skaven Blight Dinge so it'll just be the outline colour and it'll be a, a patchy colour to give some light area. So it might be a bit too bright but I don't know yet. I do not know. We shall find out. Try Ken Bromley for the Master's Brush Cleaner stuff says Skullfish. I shall have a look. I will obviously try and get my uh, channel sponsors emodels.co.uk to stock it if they can because then I can get it from them. I think they used to. Pete, mate, if you're watching this, or James, mate, if you're watching this, try and get some Master's Brush Cleaner. Your one-stop shop for all your brush cleaning needs. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, I did. Um, Daniel Smith said, just had a massive stress because I thought I'd lost two bits of the F91 Gundam I'm building. It turns out, past me is clever. Remember that those bits don't need painting. I left them on the sprue. Phew! Oh, nothing worse. Nothing worse. Although there's nothing better than finding the part on the sprue, but yeah. It sometimes gets me though. If you if you take if you leave too long and you do a project, you think right. I'm going to put this there and do that. I'm going to do a particular thing. Like I'll attach this bit, but not the other bit. Um, because I know in when I get to this other stage in the future, I've got to do X, Y, and Z. But then by the time you get to that stage, you're like, why the hell have I done that? I had two. I've got little in the in the sorting trays. I've got for this. I've got two little tiny components, little tiny polycaps, and then a little square by themselves, <clears throat> little square divider. And I'm like. What the hell are they for? Because it's been a while since I put them in. I'm like, what, what, what the hell are they for? And when do I need to attach them? And should they have already? Because I've pre-assembled some bits now. Should they have already gone in somewhere? So I had a bit of a panic, and I went through the instructions, all the steps, and it was like one of the very last steps. Oh, they go into one of these. I'm like, right, thank God for that. I'll put them in that section where those bits for the other part are. Because I just put them to one side. And thought I'll put them there for the moment because they need to be safe, and then forgotten where I'd put them and what they were for. So yeah, that was fun. Uh, things moved where's my central spot my center spot's there there we go uh william rayborn is in good morning all welcome william hello 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 welcome welcome right so that's in a few moments i'm going to give this a blast of the is it still wet give it a quick blast of the hair dry just for a second just dry it off in the middle there we go and now we can crack on with some more so again, we're on the Evil Sun's Scarlet. Evil Sun's Scarlet. Diddly bomb, a diddly bomb, a diddly bomb. See, these are the inner frame parts, but I haven't done anything on this bit yet. So you can see these two parts were both primed in grey seer. But this bit has had a, a wash of Space Wolves grey. And this bit hasn't yet, so that's just still grey seer primer. But yeah, for, for doing a Borderlands, you can see that kind of... It's not non-metallic metals. I, I, I didn't want to do non-metallic metals because I can't do non-metallic metals. It's kind of Borderlands mid metals, which in Borderlands one and two are greys basically. Go and look at the Outrunner, where there's no sort of body panels on it. Or go and look at bits of buildings and things. It's really hoofing it down with the rain outside. Wow, I can hear it. That's the kind of look I was going for. Borderlands three. It I've, actually, I, I did manage to. I, I bit the bullet and got myself some Borderlands three. Uh, and yeah, they, they have got some shiny metallics in there now, so it's changed a little bit. So this is Borderlands 1 and 2. I've not had much time to play in it in Borderlands 3. I've only had a little bit of time free to do it. I've got to say, got to say, I'm enjoying it, but it's not it's not grabbing me massively at the moment. I've not got that far. I've only had a little bit of time, so I've not got that far in, but... I don't know. I mean, it's. I'm not. You're not. We're not talking Borderlands the pre-sequel boredom here, where I just got fed up of Borderlands the pre-sequel because it just bored me senseless. I'm like, oh, really? Uh, and it's. I don't know. It's just. 
I'm not, I'm not, I've not yet had a gun that's made me go, cool, I need to use this for as long as possible. Because it, it, it's given, I actually think this is sound really weird for a loot shooter, but I think it gives you too many guns. Because in Borderlands 2, you'd, you'd pick up guns frequently, but not all the damn time. And you'd have time to get a gun and you think, right, well, that gun's got some really good stats, but I need to level up twice before I can use it because it's two levels above me. So you'd hold a gun knowing that when you get to level 12 or whatever, you can use it. This game, though, it's every time you turn around, there's a gun and it's like, well, that one might be better. That one might be better. And it's really weird. It's just kind of killing it. So I don't know. Maybe we'll, we'll find out. I've only, only got a little way in. I do have some gripes with it, even at this early stage, though. Uh, if I mean, if you love Borderlands, I'd say get it. It's, it's still Borderlands. It's still good fun. But there are some gripes, which maybe they can sort out. Um, first and foremost, well, it's not first and foremost, but there's some things. Like, for example, I can't aim at all. Like, I'm used to playing Destiny where you pull the left trigger, you aim on your target. You don't have to be, like, spot on, but you kind of get the flow of it and something like destiny or similar where you can run around quite nicely and be aiming and firing and you can be jumping around but you can still keep your keep your sights on a bad guy you know you can track them you can run around jump about you still keep the scope zoomed in on the bad guy you're hitting him every time you're not for some reason in borderlands even though i've tried to adjust the uh, the axis and the dead zones I just can't get a bead on the enemies. It can't just be down to me because I'm used to playing first-person shooters. I know what I'm doing. It just seems... I don't know. Maybe there's a maybe the auto-aim isn't aggressive enough. Uh, but I'm used to maybe in a more aggressive auto-aim of Destiny. Maybe. Could be. But it's, I mean, it works. It's just... I don't know. It's, it feels like a challenge to even hit targets sometimes. Where I, I seem to have just not been able to scope in on them. I don't know why. Um, and I thought to myself at first, well, I'll just get some badass rank and I'll get better control of weapons. And it's like, well, no, there is no badass rank. So I was like, oh, okay. So I don't know. We'll see. Um, the sound presets, I was saying this to Chris earlier on, this bugged me just because it's pointless and annoying. Um, in a normal game, you go into the audio settings and normally a developer will give you various presets. Because they'll want to be able to provide a decent sound mix for whatever you're actually listening to the game on. And typically what they'll do is they'll give you stereo. Because you might be playing on a PC with stereo speakers. Uh, or you might have a stereo soundbar or something like that. They'll give you headphones because you might be playing on a headset. And listening to the game that way. Uh, or they might give you, or they'll give you like, you know, a 5.1 surround option because you might have a 5.1 surround system. I, I have a 5.1 surround system, so. So I was like, okay, let's let's get the best sound. So I looked at it, and your settings are small speakers, hi-fi, I think headphones, and then a couple of like options that you get in other games, like things like quiet because you may be playing and you want to not be too loud or, head, or um, you know, Ones where they're designed for being a, a late night game mix, so it's not too boomy and loud, things like that. So I was like, okay, well, I don't know which one is five point one surround because it's either going to be quite small. I thought, well, my surround system actually has small speakers, but it's a five point one system. So what do they mean by small speakers? And then I thought, what the hell do they mean by hi fi? What? And I thought to myself, well, nobody, uh, nobody under my age will even know what the hell a hi fi was. Because when I was a kid, a hi-fi was a, was a stereo system. It was a, you know, it was your, your record player and your cassette deck and your amplifier and your speakers, and they were typically stereo. So I'm like, well, what the hell does that mean? What does hi-fi mean? So I tried them out, and it, it, as far as I can tell, small speakers is stereo. So why didn't they just call it stereo? Uh, because if you try playing that on a surround system, it's terrible. All the all the all the weapon sounds are nice and boomy and bassy, but when everything's going off, you can kind of see some of the sounds are cancelling each other out, and you get phasing issues. And it's like, okay, well that's just basically stereo, and it's obviously designed for small PC speakers, so they could have just called it stereo. Uh, Hi-fi. I mean, you may as well call it flipping record player or eight track for how useless the name hi-fi is. And apart from that, who plays a game with the audio coming through a hi-fi system? What? For hi-fi is basically 
as far as I can tell, surround. Like 5.1 surround. As far as I can tell, it seems to be surround. But the mix isn't great. It's quite quiet and all the bass and boom is gone. It's like, wow, really? It's a bit thin and weedy. Uh, and obviously I haven't tried headphones and stuff. So, But I'm like, why? That, what the hell does that mean? Why call it a high five? Why not just call it 5.1 surround? Or just surround or anything or Dolby 5.1 or anything like that. But hi-fi. Most people don't even know what a hi-fi is. I mean I know what a hi-fi is. Dad knows what a hi-fi is. We're all old. Honestly. So that, that bugged me a bit. And the, the mixes that you do get, they're not very good. It's like you want somewhere between small you want like the hi-fi, which is in 5.1 as far as I can tell, but with the sort of the audio settings of the small speaker, as in the bass on that is really nice. Hi-fi, if you go to surround stem, it's, it's kind of thin and weedy. Daniel Smith says, is there a VCR option? Yeah, I would be surprised. Kenneth's in. Hey, Kenneth. Welcome, dude. Welcome, welcome, welcome. G'day, bro. So that bugged me a bit. I'm not, and I've got it on, I've got it on hi-fi now, and it's like, it still doesn't sound great. But we'll carry on. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, there's little niggles, like that niggled me. Things like when you're, talking to someone if you move like an inch away from the person they go from talking to your voice to over the radio voice dead quickly and it's like well that's that's a bit weird um what else was bugging me there's a couple of things that were bugging me so the aiming was the aiming's not great it doesn't feel great uh i can't think now i had a list of complaints that were like oh. But they were just like you know nonsense complaints, things that aren't quite as good. Yeah, the the guns aren't the guns aren't grabbing me in the same way that the guns in Borderlands One. I loved them. I was a combat rifle guy. I was a five burst corro. I was a five burst five shot burst corrosive combat rifle all the way me, and maybe a sniper and a, a rocket and a and a, a machine gun for me, spider ants. Borderlands Two, they didn't really do combat rifles, so I had to suck it up and get used to using SMGs. Uh, and pistols, which is fine. Revolvers and stuff, which is fine. Uh, Borderlands, the pre-sequel, don't care. I didn't play enough of it to actually find out because it bored me absolutely pantsless. Um, but Borderlands 3, it's not... I don't know. It's not... I've not found my weapon spot yet. I've used shotguns a little bit more than I normally would because they're kind of one of the best of weapons. Uh, I'd like... I've not... I found a couple of like I don't know what they're called if they're just assault rifles, but they're not brilliant. And I know there'll be millions more weapons, and I'll probably find my good weapons, and I don't have to get attached to them. But I don't want to find specifically a specific weapon, but I want to find a weapon type. I want I've only got two weapon slots at the start. I've not got that far yet, so um, I'd like to find a happy ground where I can specialise in a certain weapon, like either you know combat rifle and sniper or machine gun and pistol or whatever you want to do sidearm type stuff don't know yet but not found but it's, it's not it's not grabbing me um, i think it's hilarious that the um tdo i had a tdo shotgun that when you reload it of course it's tdo you just throw the weapon at the enemy and it explodes it's like it basically turns into a grenade but if it doesn't hit an enemy it bounces around for ages and every time it bounces off something it says ow because tdo weapons are sentient so I had this shotgun and I, I threw it at a bad guy and it, it missed completely because I was reloading. You hit reload, it throws it at the bad guy, it missed. And then it started bouncing off the walls going, ow, 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 ow. I was like, it's brilliant. And then when it explodes, it makes little tiny grenades that go around saying ow, but in a higher pitch. It's like, okay, I appreciate that. That's kind of cool. Uh, I've got a sniper. I have picked up a sniper rifle that has an under rifle grenade launcher, a rocket launcher. It launches little rockets as a secondary fire option. That's kind of cool. But I'll get, I'll find it. It's just, it's not, it's, it's, I, I'm having that kind of same feeling that I had with Borderlands 2 where it's good, but it's not, it's not grabbing me. Uh, uh, Kenneth says, how is Mama Fox? She's doing much better, dude. Thank you very much. She's still a bit poorly sick, but she's not, she's not as bad as she was. She's having a snooze at the minute. I think she's still got a bit of a jippy belly, but she's okay. Uh, that creator's off. And I got to go by, folks. Thanks for coming in. Uh, I creator. Kind of says Borderlands Three. Yes. I've not had a lot of time to play it. I just gave it. I just gave in and thought, you know what? I'll just get it anyway. I was going to wait, but I thought, nah, I'll just get it. 
Um, what else was there? Something else. Yeah, I, I've not had any of the issues that Digital Foundry came out with, like the frame rate stuff. I've not had really any problems with it chugging frame rate or anything like that. That's fine with it. There's little niggles, like for example, I know it's now. Uh, I've got it set for visual, so it should technically be in 4K with HDR. And it looks nice, but I also find that everything kind of blends together. Uh, like before in Borderlands 1 and 2, I could tell you if I was taking out an enemy, which enemy it was. I could tell the difference between like, you know, I don't know what all the names are now, but various different bandits, the maulers and raiders and things. I could tell you what they were. But now they kind of just blend into this mass of enemy. I couldn't tell you from one enemy from the other. The only, and even things like the midgets, which are now called tinks. I assume, obviously, it's kind of fairly straightforward. They're supposed to have to rename them. It was a bit a bit out, out of order, I suppose, wasn't it? But uh, I don't know where they got the name tink from. It's a bit of a stupid name. Uh, but, yeah, they just kind of look like, before, they look like kind of awesome, like little small psychos. Now they just look like, I don't know, encephalitic children. It's just not, they don't. I don't like them at all now. They were in the first two games. In the first game, they were hilarious and they were like funny, and that's the whole point of it. In this game, they're just an enemy. They've lost that charm. So, now there's a bit of it's a bit of the Star Wars prequel effect where, you know, the original. I said this the other day. The original Star Wars, the effects were shonky and made up made with models, but they looked fantastic. Star Wars, the prequels, they did it all with CGI, and you had a billion things on screen, and you didn't know what the hell was going on. Like, you know, original Star Wars, there's two X-Wings and a Y-Wing, they're bombing the Death Star and attacking it and doing a bombing run. Here's the prequel. There's a million ships on screen. I don't know who is who. I can't tell who's doing what. I don't even know who the good guys are. I don't even know which ship I'm supposed to be looking at. You shouldn't have done this. None of it makes sense. I hate George Lucas. And yeah, it was that, it's that kind of effect. Everything's kind of looks nice now, but it's, it's kind of all indistinct now. So it's a shame. It looks nice. Uh, but there's things, there are some grievances, like, for example, you walk up to a chest with some weapons in it, or a weapon on the floor. There's some things you need to tweak, like, uh, I walked up to a, a weapon chest. Uh, this weapon chest was on like a, oh, crap on my glove. Uh, this weapon chest was on a platform uh, that I needed to be stood on. So I walk up to the chest, there's some weapons there. I look at the weapons to see the stats on them and see what they how they compare to the weapons I've got. And the, the the information screens go up off the top of my screen. I'm like, what? So I had to I had to and I was looking straight ahead. So what I had to do was basically look up to be able to see all the so I thought, maybe I'm just too close. So I I backed up a little bit. And then fell off the platform, which was on the edge of the map, and then fell down there, didn't die, and all the automated turrets that kill you if you go out of bounds kill me. And I'm like, oh, for God's sake. So I went back and double-checked it, and it, it really was that the actual weapon information, the data sheet, if you want to call it that, was too big. It was too big for the screen. It's just sized really badly. And I thought, well, maybe it's my field of view. So I changed my field of view from the default to maximum, and it was still just, it went off the top of the screen. I'm like, whoa, that's... That's really a schoolboy error, especially seeing as I'm, I'm playing in 4K. It's like that's it's really bad. And a few times I've had to just stand there and walk backwards and move my point of view all just to read what the weapon stats are. Also, uh, it's not as obvious how you can compare one weapon to the other as it was in Borderlands 1 and 2. It's more of a faff. You know, I'll go into I'll go into the a store and I'll be like, right, I've got this weapon. How does it compare to the one that I can buy? How long? I've got to go through 18 button presses. Coming out your backpack takes too many button presses. Little things like that. They need to change. They need to tweak those. But I'm having fun with it. I've not played a lot of it at all. Do you need to move this out of the way? Hang on. I've not got a lot of play time in. Only a little bit. But I'm, I'm hopeful that it will it will grab me even more. I'm, I'm still just in the starting map area, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm hoping it gets better. I mean, if not, it is just more Borderlands, so it's not the end of the world. But uh, we'll see. Do 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 do. Need to find a kick-ass revolver. I think at this. I think I'll just abandon the idea of going back to combat rifles, and just hope that I can find a kick-ass revolver. 
Uh, now, I did ask earlier on, Bench and Belly, and then I, I never actually got around to reading it, so I do apologise, folks. Can I ask again? Because the chat's well gone past that now. Uh, can I ask again, Bench and Belly? What's on your bench and what's in your belly? And I'll actually try and read them this time. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Oh, itchy nerve. Uh, I don't know what the plan is for dinner tonight. I'm talking to my own belly. Uh, I think it might be just a lazy night and having McDonald's. I know, I know. You can't go, if you're feeling lazy, you can't go wrong with a bit of McD's though. Uh, let's have a look. Mordraka says, belly fluids, flat lemonade. <laughs> wow. Blow down the straw, make some temporary bubbles. It'll give it a bit of fizz. Flat lemonade, uh, bench, minatorium, uh, sorry, minatorium armored crates. Oh, minatorium armored crates and a game thesis report. Awesome. I don't know what a game thesis report is, but it sounds good. Oh, uh, itchy nose. Kenneth says, predator, car and fasting. Oops. Okay, that's working on his uh, Predator. Awesome, like three and a half, is it a couple of foot tall? Beautiful resin statue. And he's slowly, 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 slowly painting this, this flesh. Looks fantastic. I really wish you could show pictures in chat. Then again, it's probably a bad idea. Oh, a 1,500 word, 15,000 word for an assignment. Okay, I've got you. Cool. Now you can see here, there's this white bit in the middle of this shoulder pad. I'm actually going to paint maybe hazard stripes on there or something like that. So I'm not really, it's just primed at the moment. Uh, I actually forgot to paint it red, but then I'm like, you know what? I'll do hazard stripes on it, so it's not a problem at all. So I don't mind if I get a bit of red on it now. I'm trying to be careful, but I don't mind if I get some red on it because I'm painting over that later anyway. But we are going for a dirty, grimy look, so it's all gravy. Uh, fasting, Kenneth, says Dad. Yes, I'll let you two have that conversation elsewhere. But I agree with, I agree with Dad, Kenneth. So there you go. <laughs> Waggly finger. Uh, just over half a metre tall. Yeah, cool. Foot and a half. Awesome. It does look beautiful, though. It's, it's Predator. Kenneth's a bit of a good, bit of a good painter, is our Kenneth. Bit of a good painter. Do, 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 do. Uh, you see now why I need your company when I do this, because it don't require a lot of thinking. But you guys hanging out with me makes life much, much better. Because then I'm... I'm uh, well, peeps, I've got to grab some rack time, so I'll catch you all on the next run. Oh, a big dot of paint on there. Hang on. Uh, thanks for coming in, Modraka. Really appreciate it. See you next time, dude. See you next time. Do, 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 do. Uh, what was going to say? Any other bench and bellies? I said I, I did ask earlier on that. I totally didn't get a chance to read any of them back, so because everything jumped. Now I am getting some of this red paint on this white bit here as well, which is going to have the um, the Borderlands metallic effect on it. So that's just the grey sear primer. But again, I'm not too fussed because, same with these little grey bits, if I do get any on there and I have to get rid of it, I can just quickly brush over with the grey sear primer and then I'm going to be going over with the contrast paints anyway. So anything where I get any of this like dry brush, that's why I can use a big brush. If I get any of this on the paint that I don't want to be red, I can tidy it up later. It's not a biggie. Not a biggie. Do, 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 do. How's the weather in uh, Australia land then, Kenneth? Because you're in the, you're in your spring now, isn't it? Spring in Australia. Get eye. William Wilms. Welcome, William. Says Master Grey Jester. No, I, I need to do a Jester at some point. Uh, and the scrambled eggs. Toss salad and scrambled eggs. TM. That's that one done. See, I'm not being careful. I'm not, I'm not. Hopefully you might be said a bit. Wow. Hello. Use words in that sentence, Fox. 
Hopefully you might be able to see a bit of difference if I compare those two. Just with this first coat, it's not a massive difference. You're not looking at vastly different colours. It's quite subtle. But once we get the second dry brush coat on there, it'll look a bit less, a bit more obvious. It's nine degrees and nice and dark. Ooh, nine degrees. It's kind of, it's not warm here today, but it's kind of a bit humid. It's raining outside a lot, quite a lot. Babyhead Master X says, got to sleep now. I've been pulling all nighters lately. Good night, guys. Thanks for coming in, Babyhead Master. Uh, Edward Leonard. Hey, Edward. Says, Fifth, uh, one five thousand scale Star Destroyer lighted Vermac. Ah, lighted. I'll start that again. I've got paint on me. Oh, God damn it. I don't know where this paint's coming from. Well, I know where it's coming from. God damn it, Citadel. One five thousand scale Star Destroyer lighted version. Mac and cheese with portobello mushrooms, shiitake mushrooms, gruyere and cheddar cheese. That sounds really nice. The red looks more saturated after the dry brush. Yeah, that's that's the kind of idea I'm going for is, I mean, it, it, keep in mind though, Kenneth, when you're looking at the colors on screen, it, it does look more saturated because of white balance and everything else. In real life, the Evil Suns is kind of a red, it's a brighter red than the Mephiston. So it, it looks like, the best way I can describe it is, uh, if you look at a van outdoors, like a van on the, on the motorway that's got that kind of layer of road grime all over it, but where the handles of the back door are, you've got the clean bit where the, the road grime's been rubbed away by the person opening the door. It's that. You've got that red in the road grime layer. So it, it's quite subtle. And there's that squig pink to go on the top of the red anyway. So, but yeah, I'm not, going for a, I'm not going for a bright red on this. It's going to be dirty anyway. So more an in, a, a sort of faded, slightly faded red. And a bright pink chips. Pink chips. Oh, yes. Uh, F91 still hopefully finished by next week, says Daniel Smith. And I think I'm having some sausage pasta for dinner. Ooh, I like the sound of that. Well, they have to ask, is that pasta with sausage or is it pasta made out of sausage? <gasps> Imagine that. Imagine like sausage made into tagliatelle. Ooh, meat-based pasta. That seems like a good idea. Dad told me is red is good. And I quote, <laughs> is red is good. Dad could never play uh, Warhammer 40k because what happens if he, if he, if, because if I reckon, like, if Dad was playing, went to get on the table and he put all his pieces out and the person playing him decided to pop up some ultramarines, he just flipped the table because Dad doesn't do blue, do you, Dad? Don't show dad blue things. You won't like him when he sees blue things. Cue Incredible Hulk music. Do, do, do. Now, uh, again, I'm not being too careful on the insides of these shoulder pauldrons or anything like that, where I've got inner frame uh, near the red, because there is going to be something I'm going to do with the inside of the frame parts where it's like inner workings. Uh, because what I'm going to do is, and I've said this before, is, is give it that kind of underneath a train look. Uh, which I've said before, go and look at a train at the station. You've got the nice shiny like carriage and then you've got the wheels and all the stuff underneath. And that's got that kind of powdery, dark, not quite black, but powdery looking colour. Just road grime and stuff. But I'm going to try and do that. And I found the easiest way to do that is dead simple. It's just an airbrush. Uh, I'm over and make either engine grime or road grime over it. It's very lightly and it just gives it that kind of mushroomy tint and just makes everything look like... I've got paint on me. Oh, do you know? Not a biggie. Right, I'm getting paint off this pot now. Games Workshop, sort your pots out. Uh, it just gives it that kind of road grammar look. And I'll be doing that on either bits on the inside parts of armour uh, and on some of the inner frame parts where they show through. Just to suggest like mechanical grime that's built up because it's inner workings. Handy way though, if you're if you're like for example, so let's say you're making a gumpler and you want to have that kind of road grime effect. Uh, if are we buffering? Have we had some frame drops? Let's have a look. Uh, nope, not that I can see. Um, yeah, if you want, to, if you want a quick and simple way to get that kind of grimy mechanical interior look on your gumpler armor, the easiest way to do it 
is to prime in black. If you're using an airbrush, obviously. Uh, prime in black. And then when you airbrush the colour on, get yourself some more tissue. When you airbrush the colour on, obviously on the outside bits of the arm, you're building up your colours to be whatever colour you want, like red or white or blue or whatever it might be. But on the inside of the armour, you, you airbrush less. So let's say I was painting this red armour, or maybe not red, but look, for example, prime it in black, and then I spray over my, my paint on the outside to get a bright red colour. So I might spray with a cream colour first and then a red over the top. On the inside, what I would do is where there's black primer, just spray the red, but spray it light enough that it, it's still a very dark red grey colour. Because what you're doing is you're taking it away from black, but you're keeping a hint of the the rest of the armour colour, like red or blue or whatever. And it just has that kind of under machinery kind of look to it. Now you can't really do it with what we're doing here with this dry brushing. It doesn't really work like that. Um, which way does this go? No, it goes that way, doesn't it? Uh, it doesn't really work when you're doing brushing, really. This is where we have to do airbrush on some, say, uh, road grime or engine grime later on. Uh, just to get that dusty effect. But if you're doing airbrushing right from the start, you can do it the other way around. And just basically, you're only adding a hint of the colour with most of the black prime underneath, and it just has that kind of used equipment. If like, if, if imagine like I say, if, if it was a real thing, this gumpler, you take the armour off, and the inside would have this like layer of soot and not soot because there's no burning, but you know that kind of dust and grime and stuff like that uh, that will build up on the inside of the armour because it never gets washed away. That's what I'm trying to reproduce. It'll make more sense when I actually do it. Uh, Fox isn't using Dad's device. That's why you're getting paint. I love you. No, it's it's not that. It's the stupid, stupid, stupid lid design. I don't need to use a Dad device for this because it's literally open for three seconds when I'm getting paint out. So uh, if I was proper painting, I would. But no, it's, it's Citadel's stupid pot design. Uh, let's have a look. Just send in the Bane Blade, Dad says. Yeah, if he was confronted with an ultramarine army. Yeah. What if they had one and it was blue? <gasps> uh, apologies if you got some buffering. That might be YouTube. I'm not sure any drop frames at my end, so it might just be YouTube that was doing that. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Retro Rabbit is in. It says, morning. Blah. Morning. Oh, I forgot Fox doesn't use Dad's device when dry brushing, says Lynn. Jan's car says hello everyone sorry I'm late to watching the stream had a working interview you don't have to apologize you don't have to uh, it's not like you get told off for being a bit late but I hope your interview went well if it's for a job I hope you get the job unless it's one of those interviews where you don't actually want the job you're just doing it because you have to do it in which case but no I hope you get the job Dad spent months doing your R&D mock-ups for that battle, that bottle holder device and then the time to send it and Fox doesn't use it, says Kenneth. I do use it. You never see me do a shade or anything else. Of course I do. But not, not for this because it's only open for a second. And the good thing is I'm not going to spill the paint really, am I? It's too thick and stodgy. It's, uh, it's for my shades. And other... Uh, I definitely use it for things like... Um, thinned enamel paints and stuff and panel line washes is absolutely vital for things like that stuff where like if you knock this over it's not really gonna get it's too thick but yeah doing like shades or anything like that absolutely dad device maximum uh, how did it go asks lynn Ian says, uh, I'm really excited they got one more person to interview, so I've got to wait till then. But nice one. I love purple, says Ian's car. It's a nice colour. Uh, Gundanian says, how do you denub? I use a file, it takes five seconds. Uh, I've got some god hand nippers. So what I tend to do is I get really anal about denubbing. It's like, oh, it drives me nuts. Um, leave a little bit off. When, oh, oh, Citadel, your paint. Oh, triggered. Oh. Gonna go outside and shout at the clouds at this break. Right, let's just sort this nonsense out. Yeah, leave a little bit on the on the plastic when I take it off the sprue. Trim it as best I can with the god hands to get it down to absolute minimum. 
Then I will shave it with a sharp uh, modeling knife just to shave it down as flat as possible. And then when it's as flat as I can get it with shaving, I'll then sand it very lightly, very gently for the last little step just to smooth it down. Uh, or if it's small enough, I'll use my, um, if it's in certain situations, I can use my uh, Citadel scribing tool just to get it flat without putting any marks in there. But it depends on the plastic. I'll use either files or sanding sticks. Uh, sometimes I like to use files because they don't leave as much damage once, once you sand them back afterwards. Some nubs I'll just go in and like sand them away. But where it's say on armor or something and I want to keep the sanding to a minimum to avoid any sanding marks, I'll go ahead and use knives and stuff instead. Depends on the part. Do 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 Chef job Lynn at Red Bus Nursery. Oh cool. Good luck, dude. I couldn't I couldn't be a chef or a cook. Purely because how could I be surrounded by all that food and food smells all day long and not be able to eat any of it? I, 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 prob, I, and also, I hate cooking anyway. But even if I like cooking, I couldn't I couldn't do it. Because I'd just become like a 900 pound monster. <laughs> Welcome to your second day. I may have put some weight on. How much can you add like an extra door width? Ah. Yeah, I, I just would struggle. Yeah, I, think, I actually hate cooking. I'm far too lazy. I just want to eat. I like to eat. I hate to cook. Because cooking is just time that's just not eating for me. So. <laughs> Kenneth says, when I watch a video and someone leaves a Citadel bottle open, I lose all interest in their painting and wait to see if they're going to knock the bottle over. <laughs> oh, yeah. Actually, when somebody does some some painting with these paints and leaves the lid open while they're working, I actually wait. I actually sit and wait to see if they whinge about how fast their paints dry out. Because it's like, that's because you leave the lid open. Keep the lid shut, it won't dry out quite as I know they dry out fast anyway, but it's like, you know, leave the lid open, they will dry out faster. You spoon. Right, this is quite a small area here to be doing with a big massive brush, but again, I'm only going for like hints. Hints of uh, light areas. Because once you get the outlining and chipping on this thing, on this the head part here is it's not going to be hard to see the the light areas and it is that kind of watercolor effect again coloring that i'm going for so i'm not going to have obvious high and low light areas or anything like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like there's a little bit of agrax shade on the helmet here on the cowling it actually looks on camera by the way i've just noticed to you guys that looks just bright red in reality, it's not bright red. Just notice now the colour's way off. Uh, in reality, it's not actually that bright red. It's kind of a, it's still red, but it's not quite glowy bright red. I mean, that looks like fucking blood. It's not that bright. So do keep in mind that what you're seeing is not actually what this thing looks like for real. For reals. But yeah, there's like a blob of uh, dark patch of agrax shade there where it kind of pulled a little bit, but it's not physically. You can't. There's no lump. That's great. Because what I can do is I could try and cover it up or later on I'll just do a little ink outline around it, put some cross hatching in and you've got a little paint chip, a little sort of weathering effect. Brilliant. It's brilliant that is. Hey, it's great that is. Now what I'm not going to do, I'm going to do a very little tiny bit of dry brushing in here just to clean up these bits of agrax. But again, not much because I want that to be darker inside because we'll give that an airbrush of the road grime later on because it's interior uh, and it'll just look a little bit darker like the dust has collected because people go in and they may wash the exterior but you can't really it's like underside of your car it's got that sort of gray mushroomy powdery look to it that's the kind of look i go for sometimes with the seamy underbelly parts seamy underbelly underbelly thing is right you get an underbelly but is there such thing as an overbelly Good question. We have the word underbelly, like the seamy underbelly, but we never have the seamy overbelly. Ooh, blow me nose. Uh, chefs don't eat, do they? They graze, says Dad. I also remove using Gundam Planet nippers. Uh, yes, I did. Um, 
The difficulty for me, because I'm in the UK, the difficulty for me is I need to blow my nose again. God damn it, nose. Come on now, just behave. I'm on telly. Stop being a spoon. Uh, the difficulty for me being in the UK is that if I want, because the two best nippers you can get are uh, God Hands or Gundam Planet nippers. They get both cost big monies. And the problem for me in the UK is that no one in the UK stocks them. I can only get them from either Japan or Asian places, stores, or the US. And given the fact they're both expensive tools to start with, uh, the shipping for them is redonkulous. Like over here in the UK, you'd pay £45 for the nippers, say God hand nippers, you pay 45 quid for the God hand nippers. Because I, I went to order some. Uh, you pay 45 quid for the... Oh, Mama Fox is up and about. <laughs> she didn't know I was streaming. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, I, I looked into it a couple of years ago. It was like I would pay 45 quid for the nippers for God hands. And it would also cost me 45 quid to ship them. Uh, oh, Dad's off. Got to be back in 30. See you in a bit, Dad. He's going for a great big pool. But he's not really. Yeah, so it would be like 45 quid for the nippers, which is a fair price because they're wonderful tools. But then it'd be 45 quid shipping. I'd be like, you know. Uh, now, it is only actually through very, very kindness of one of my followers. And I do apologize because I can't remember who it was that sent me to him. It was, oh, I can't remember who it was now because it's a couple of years ago now. Uh, I was actually gifted that they were sent to me as in, a, in a care package by one of my followers. So thank you very much uh, to whoever it was. I can't remember. I really can't remember. I'm, I'm terrible with names. Um, but I was gifted those. So I treasure them. But yeah, it would be like 80 quid for me to get those. And for the planet... Uh, Gundam Planet ones they were a little bit cheaper to ship but it was still you'd still be looking at to me about 30 35 quid which for a pair of nippers I'm, I'm, I'm not paying 35 quid shipping and then keep in mind of course when they turn up on the doorstep because the value is 30 or 40 quid it's not guaranteed that I wouldn't get an import charge as well so yeah so I've only got a pair of god hands because of one of my followers was super super kind and sent me a pair and I've got a pair of God Hand tweezers because Kenneth, who's in chat, was super, super kind and sent me a pair of those. And I love my God Hand tweezers. They're not branded. I didn't know they were God Hand until I found out later. And it was like, wow. Because I was like, oh, Kenneth sent me some tweezers. Thanks, dude. And they went, yeah, they're God Hands. It was like, oh, wow, they're like 500 pound. Bless you, Kenneth. So I, I do apologize, whoever it was. I think it was Stein Van Gemmer that sent me the God Hands. I think it was Stein Van Gemmer that sent me the. So thank you very much to Stein. I think it was you. If it wasn't you, well, just thank you anyway, because you're still a follower. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if you can... God hands you can get in the US. Like Lynn says, you must get some. They are really, really good. It's just over here. That It's not worth the money. They are worth the money, but not... Like the, the price for them, 45 quid, but they're not worth the 45 quid shipping. And the, the people that sell them, like, you know, in Japan and Korea and stuff, they know they can charge that shipping. Because we've got no other way to get them. So they can stiff you on that. It's like, okay. Which is weird when you think a lot of those little sort of mom and pop Japanese retailers on Amazon, they might charge you that for the God hands. But it, when it comes to like kits, they can charge almost no shipping. I bought the uh, Perfect Grade Strike Gundam many years ago. I never built it, but I got the Perfect Grade uh, Strike, Strike Rouge. I ordered it. It cost me like 100 and whatever quid 130 quid or something whatever it was uh strike rouge with the sky grabber whatever it's called um and that was 100 odd quid free shipping and i'm like really from japan it's a box the size of a house so it's weird like some of the stuff you order where they know you can get it kind of from somewhere else like the us shipping to europe they'll offer they'll offer free shipping on crazy crazy things my space battleship yamato the big one the 1500 scale that i've not done yet i know that was like 85 quid for the kit and free shipping from japan i'm like wow that's ridiculous so it is amazing how sometimes they charge almost no shipping at all often actually no shipping because they know you can go somewhere else and get that kit so they want to attract your custom rather than you go to hobby link japan or somewhere else uh but then it's something that they know you can't really get anywhere else They'll, they'll, they won't put the price up for the item because then they'd have to charge that for somebody else. They can't really say for people in 
Japan or wherever, it's $30. But if you want to buy it in Europe, the, the item costs $70. They can't do that. But what they can do is just slap a big fat shipping charge on it and make money that way. Because, you know, if I go on a website and it says, uh, this model, this this thing, it's 75, 750 yen, 7,500 yen or 250 quid. I'm like, yeah, hang on. Why am I being charged more if I'm in the UK? That, yeah, so you'd see that a mile away. But they can put a higher shipping charge. So they know they've got you over a barrel, which is fair play to them. That's how business works. I'm not I'm not naive. So, yeah, but yeah, good God hands are great. I just if my God hands break, I won't get a replacement pair because I can't justify 80 quid. I'd have to get some Zuron or something that I can actually get. They won't be as good, but they'll be good. Uh, let's look. I started nipping around 20 years ago using a pair of wire cutters. Sky Grasper says Gundanium. Yes, Sky Grasper, that's the word. What did I call it? I can't remember now. Sky Stabber. <laughs> I forgot what I called it now. Uh, love my local... I love my God hands. Got them at my local hobby shop. No shipping, but still cost 50 bucks. Yeah, they're not cheap, but they are worth the, the price. They're worth the price of admission. They're just not worth a big shipping cost. Uh, the sofa has arrived, still watching, but got to go help my mum, says Eon's car. Yay, furniture. Yeah, don't get your mum installed in the sofa, go and do it for her. Mums aren't there to put sofas in, mums are there to get you to put the sofa in. With a bit of, could you just? Yeah. When it comes to mums, there is no, could you just? Could you just put that on the wall? Six hours later when you built a whole rack of shelves. Right, I'll put it on the shelf now, shall I? Yeah. You've got to love mums, haven't you? Uh, right, so that's as far as I want to go on there. I'm not doing too much on these handy bits. I'm leaving them kind of dark just for fun. Time away. We are on four of the o'clock. Mm, be a slightly longer one today. Yes, it's a shame, like, you look at this, and when you're seeing it now, it's just red. It's just bright red, like a fireman's helmet or something. But it's not. It's not actually bright red. And that looks, like, unshaded, but it's not. It's... it's. I'll see if I can... Let's just see if I can adjust it. Hang on. Let's see if I can get it more realistical, like, to what I'm actually seeing. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Zoom in a bit, first of all. Okay, so it's not quite that orange. Let's try some colour funkness. Uh, zzz. Zzz too bright it's kind of it's never going to be quite right no i'm not gonna i'm not gonna match it i don't think i don't think you're gonna anywhere near what i'm actually seeing there you go it's like that it's not like that at all like that like that it's too blue i've got it's a webcam it's never going to give you exactly the right color uh, if anything, that's about as close as I can get it. But you're getting shine off the shade as well, which kind of hides a lot of stuff. And it's zoomed in, which doesn't help. But you get you get the idea. It looks much better in real life. Let's just leave it at that. There we go. Right, I've got an itchy nose again. Uh, E-Model sells a really good pair of Tamiya nippers that are about £30 for those in the UK, says Daniel Smith. Yes, my channel sponsors emodels.co.uk. Thank you for that. But your one-stop shop for your model making needs. I do have some of the Tamiya nippers. I've got a couple of pairs of different ones. Uh, the ones I've got are really old, but they work fine, absolutely fine. Mine are really old, they're a bit worn now. Uh, I think the models also have some of the Zoran ones, which are supposed to be very good. <laughs> Nothing more compared to a God Hand. I can't speak for Planet Gundam ones because I've never tried those. Uh, but you know, you can get good ones. I wouldn't recommend you try using the Citadel ones for anything other than cutting Games Workshop models off Games Workshop sprues because they're like kind of garden shears. <laughs> They're kind of Gordon Shear territory, those ones. So, yeah, they're a bit hardcore. They're for big jobs. Uh, right, I'll just put that there. You think I've done a lot? I've got all this to go yet. Got all these to dry brush yet. <laughs> yeah, I've got loads of stuff to. There's more red armor than there is yellow. And this is only, I've only done the first coat. I've not even started with the squig orange. So, there you go. <laughs> to me a sharp pointed cutter yes and on that note it's just a chance for me to do a bit of a sponsor shout out again as always like i said at the start this channel is supported by three major groups there are of course my patrons my patreon supporters 
uh, who I absolutely adore. They uh, basically, the majority of my incomes come from them. I do this for a living. They pay my bills. They make sure I've got food on the table, uh, lights are on, and there's heating and food and food, obviously. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So I always like to say a big massive thank you to all my patrons. Uh, you can, of course, if you want to help support this channel, you can do directly by going to patreon.com forward slash model making guru. Uh, and if you wish, if you're willing, you can support, help support this channel, help keep the lights on. Yeah, you can go as much or as little as you like. You can go from a dollar onwards. So whatever you'd like to help support, if you're willing to support me, that's absolutely, that's, I nearly said a rude word then. It's absolutely fabulous. Yeah, <laughs> nearly said a rude word. That gives me monetization. Uh, yeah, so you can actually support the channel directly. Go to patreon.com forward slash model making guru and help out. Uh, there are various advantages. Um, depending on what tier you choose, uh, you can get access to Patreon exclusive videos. Like this is a Patreon exclusive build, for example. So although these streams are open to everybody and everybody can watch this and see this, if you want to actually watch the video build series, you have to be a patron. It's not available to anybody apart from patrons. So keep that in mind. Uh, but yeah, the various rewards. If non-patron stuff, you can get a week early without adverts, things like that. Any video builds. Uh, patrons will always get to see them first. Oh, I've got some of the... Oh, oh red paint on there. Oh, now I can get rid of that with some chipping. It's not a problem. I'm going to change my gloves because that's just annoying me now. Oh, just frustrations. Oh. Right, let me, I've got the sweaty hands, so let me just dry my hands off. <laughs> you can't put fresh gloves on a hand when you're just taking a glove off. It doesn't work that way. You only get sadness and disappointment and a mild case of the cling. Oh, did the health just go down by 400? Uh, I didn't hear anything. Nobody's in a super chat. No. Uh, do 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 oh sticky hands now uh yeah look at I me mean, look at that oh now i can easily fix that with some paint chipping later on so i'm not too fussed because i'll be doing weathering on the legs on the whole thing anyway so that might get a big fat paint chip or some other kind of weathering or something i can't get these gloves on now. i'm gonna have to give it a minute for my hands to dry out oh, right let's get the paint off that brush did fox put paint on via gloves no i put paint on via stupid stupid paint pots God damn it, Games Workshop. Seriously. Oh. This is why I like the fact they have dry paints, because then you can use the dry paints without getting paint everywhere. But you know what? I really wish they did a dry paint for every single colour they do. Because then it would just mean, yeah, brilliant. I could do this without getting paint everywhere. I'm going to turn that piece of tissue around. Um, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's get some more tissue. Do, yeah, so I can cover that with some chipping and stuff later on. If I need to, I can just dry brush the yellow over it again. It's not a big problem. It's not the end of the world. It's just annoying. Uh, -do. That's how I knew you were streaming, because I got an email from Patreon. Yep. Well, I post up, when I was going to stream, I put a post up on Patreon saying, hey, I'm, I'm streaming again. So, yeah, so you can support me on Patreon if you wish to. You don't have to. It's, it's completely optional. You don't have to. But it is really awesome way to show your support if you like my content uh, of course we're also sp uh, we i am also sponsored directly uh, by emodels.co.uk uh, they are the uk's largest online model retailer the uk's largest tamir stockist let's get some of this paint off my brush um and they're really awesome guys there's a link in the video in the description below this video so go and check them out for all your traditional stuff tools paints kits traditional model making stuff uh you know planes cars trucks World War II stuff, armor, armor fighting vehicles, all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's awesome. And of course, I am supported by Goblin Gaming, uh, which is basically e models, but for tabletop gaming. So they sell all the tools and kit you need for making the models. They also do things like card games, uh, trading card games, all that kind of stuff, Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, all those kind of things. Uh, anything like that, they are people to go to. They have 20% off Games Workshop, uh, Conflict 47, and Malifaux, uh, and massive savings on all their other ranges. So go and check them out. Again, link in the description below this video. If you want to go to Goblin Gaming, don't just go to the website. Use the link that's in the description down here, 
that's in the description below use that link because that's my affiliate link when you go if you use that link they know you've come from me and they give me a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a bit of cash coming forward for me i get a little bit of commission on that it doesn't cost you anything but they know you've come from me and i get a little bit of a bonus for that so there you go right so if i can get these gloves on yet uh dave is in from butcher that model another one of your mods welcome dave do 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 uh, opening up another window just to listen to the Sports 19 Dickety 9 theme music by the Fox Band. <laughs> yes, my silly theme tune. I've got a um, Federation runabout to do, a Deep Space Nine Federation runabout, and I was tempted to do the same for that with the DS9 theme, but Paramount would just, or CBS would just sue me off the face of the earth if I did that. And also for the Perfect Grey Millennium Falcon. I thought I could do the Star Wars. No, Disney will just stick me on a spike and rotate me at great speeds until I go into orbit if I did that. So, yeah. Uh, Lynn says, when I will, when I can, I will fox. You know that? Ah, thank you very much, Lynn. I know. I know, Spud. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, Dave says he's to Kenneth that he's knackered because it's been a busy day. Doodle -doo -doo, doodle -doo -doo. doodle -doo. uh, Dave actually misspelled Lynn and then got told off. Or he got away with it. You know Dave. He, he's going to spell your name wrong. He's had a long day at work. He's tired. You have to let him off. Right, I finally got these gloves. Oh, oh. The one thing about taking gloves off and putting on new gloves, unless your hands are completely dry, everything sticks and you have to pull the fingers. Oh, it's like that when you get the little... Flippy floppy bit and I have to... Oh, it does me head in. Oh. Right, let's carry on then. So, yeah, so I can cover that with... God damn it. I can cover that with uh, with some weathering. I'm just going to give the hair, the brush a quick blast of the hair dry because it's damp still. A very quick blast. I don't want to dry it out too much. There we go, almost. Almost there! Stay on target. Stay on target. There we go. Uh, I didn't tell Dave off. I'm joking with him. I know that, Lynn. I know that. Gundanium says I can never find gloves that fit my big mitts. I'm kind of similar. These are supposed to be large, medium, but like some of them are a bit too small and some of them are a bit too large. So I really don't know how glove sizing for surgical gloves actually works because it's just, I could almost assume it's kind of made up. When we say large, we mean maybe large, maybe small. I don't know. Uh, Dave says, keep telling you, you can put a boat on a ship. Oh, I can. Kenneth says, um, I lost it now. Uh, Kenneth says, at least you can relax and build your boat. And Dave says, ship, Kenneth, ship. He says, I keep telling you, you can put a boat on a ship, but you can't put a ship on a boat. And Kenneth says, whatever floats your boat, Dave. <laughs> Bless both of you. Bless both of you. Maybe I should start a Patreon so I can support you, Chris and others, says Lynn. Start a Patreon. I, this, it was Lynn, Lynn is creating. Lynn Dipple is, start, is creating a Patreon to support other people on Patreon. Don't think that's how it works. That's like writing yourself a check for a million dollars and then cashing it and spending the money before it actually f fails. I don't think that's how it works. But, you know, points for effort. <laughs> Time where we are on twenty past four in the afternoon here on Spong FM. Just time for a quick song before we go over to the news desk. Find out what's been happening in the world of plants. Now over to Tom Beef on the sports desk. Tom. <laughs> Yes, well, we've got lots of sports here happening uh, in, in the world, and we've looked at all of it, and it's all kind of sporty. Back to you on the news desk, Dave. Thanks, Ted. I'll stop. I don't know where I was going with that. The only ship I know of is our friendship, Dave, says Kenneth. Ah, You see what he did there, Dave? It's adorbs. Kenneth's adorable. Everybody likes Kenneth. Kenneth's awesome. 
Uh, Kenneth, the, Kenneth is. Uh, You've heard me refer to Kenneth before. Kenneth's the guy that, like, two or three years ago had never even painted a model, and now he's better than all of us when it comes to brush painting minis and stuff. He's like, wow! Beats the pants off all of us. And Dave, of course. Dave used to do, like, tabletop stuff and minis and things many years ago. He used to teach people and then stopped doing it for a long time, and it's, it's my fault that he got back into it because now he's addicted to the, to the to Warhammer as well. Again. Kenneth says, will Mama Fox do the weather? It'd be like, and now over to Mama Fox for the weather. Oh, it's a bit parky. Back to you. <laughs> it's kind of ironic that actually, because I'll give you some, I'll give it, I'll, I should give you some uh, of my family information, some background information on me, because as a, as a, as a, a, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, okay? I'm not a celeb or anything like that, but as a presenter, uh, I try and obviously maintain a persona when I do my stuff. That's how you do. You know, you you have a, you play a character. Well, no matter what you do, and even like this, when I'm I'm doing videos for you guys and live streams, I'm I'm creating a character. I'm being a character. It's not really me. There are things that I think and believe, and things that I feel that I would never express on on video. Uh, you know, and, and things that I would do that are just not relevant. And there is, you know, my private life and stuff, which is nobody's business. And uh, so everybody who does a video like this, the kind of stuff I do, anything like that, to a certain degree, you can vary, but to a certain degree, you present a persona. And the, the people who follow you don't get to know really everything about you. That's the whole, It's not like you're somebody's property. But anyway, I shall, I shall reveal a fact about Fox, a Fox fact for you today, exclusively because you decided to show, show up uh, <laughs> Retro Rabbit Studio says, My outside weather part 43 rain! Please like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Yes. <laughs> you knew I was going to read that. I don't know why it censored your comment. My first weather report. It's weathery. Weather everywhere. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so uh, here's a little bit of foxy facts. For you, because just because you guys could be asked to turn up for the live stream, I'll give you a foxy fact. Uh, foxy family fact. Talking about weather is bizarrely. If you're in the UK, you'll know who this is. But bizarrely, here's a, here's a foxy family fact. Uh, Fred Talbot, who was a British weatherman, was a family friend, and it's because of my dad that Fred Talbot was a weatherman at Granada TV. There you go, there's a foxy fact. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Fred Talbot was a uh, uh, British TV weatherman for like 20 years before he got uh, arrested in the whole um, child abuse scandal stuff in the UK a few years back and got sent to jail for like nine years or something for kiddie fiddling. He was a teacher at secondary school. He was my biology teacher at secondary school and he was a family friend. No, nothing happened. I have no, I have no information either way about to the validity of any claims. But uh, he was a family friend, and he, when he, let's just say, suddenly left the school I went to. <laughs> yeah, we didn't know why at the time. We didn't know. No idea. It turns out he, he was kind of, he had to leave. Various rumours at the time. Anyway, yeah, he was looking for work, and my dad was like, "Well, they're looking for a weatherman on Granada News. Why don't you go for that?" So dad gave him loads of advice and suggested how he does it said just be yourself and wear a silly jumper and stuff and he got the job so it's kind of my dad that got him that job sort of indirectly so he was a family friend uh you know he came to the came to the wake for my dad and uh, used to come around every now and then but no nothing ever happened but yeah family family thing there the little foxy family history that uh, fred Talbot was a family friend until obviously all the stuff came out and then it was like yeah we don't give a shit about you anymore bye <laughs> You're going away now. Do 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 do. Interesting facts. We were actually interviewed by the police uh, as part of the investigation. They came round and said, "Can we just ask you some, you know, questions?" Because he he knew you. Was it? Uh, I can't remember if it was the the, the solicitors for the defence or for the prosecution. But I think it was the def not the police. Let's say the the legal team. I should say spoke to. Us. I think it was the le the prosecution sent some solicitors to talk to us and say basically 
you know, we're obviously building up the case, blah, blah, blah. We couldn't give them information because we didn't know anything. So, yeah. So there you go. There's a foxy family fact. And it's it, it does lead me to think, you know, it's because obviously, like, you know, we the moment we found it all out, we're like, we washed our hands of him, like, yeah, you can die in a fire. Bye. We didn't uh, know anything about it. And as soon as we found out, we're like, OK, no longer part of a member, of, you know, family friend. But um, it makes you wonder because I found myself thinking no sympathy for the guy at all. You know, but what happens if you are like so well known that you, you people will recognize you instantly and you go to prison for something like that that's just utterly utterly socially unacceptable that no one is going to give you any leeway for like you go to you go to jail for like financial crimes you get out of jail and it's like oh yeah you were that bloke that did the forgery and there you go whatever fine have a job but imagine going to prison for something like that when you get out nobody's going to show you any sympathy at all nobody's going to forgive you for it how do you even just survive? How is it? I mean, not that I actually care. Like I said, for, as far as our family's family can rot in hell, but what 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 eruptions in that situation? He's completely screwed, and rightly so. But it's like, what do you do? You get out of prison. Everybody recognises you instantly. You're not going to get a job. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, yes. So there you go. Fun fox family fact. I tend to move the stick instead of parts when hand painting, mainly because I use not with gloves when hand painting or airbrushing. Uh, I do as well, but sometimes it's some of these parts. There's only little tiny areas that can the stick can grip onto, so I have to actually handle the part anyway. Especially when I'm dry brushing. If I was, uh, I wear gloves just. I mean, I'm only wearing gloves really, so I'm not scraping paint off the parts. It's more just to protect the paint because this is acrylic paints, and acrylic paints are not the most durable. So uh, the gloves is just really to protect the paint from scruffage and scrapage you know I don't want to catch a fingernail on the paint and scrape a big scrape in it because if you know if I get a little tiny chip on a, on an edge that's fine I can cover that as a paint chip it just acts as a paint chip if I put a big scratch down with a thumbnail you can't really you can you kind of strip in the paint off at that point and paint it again basically so yeah uh prison for what says lynn dipple oh uh, he was a, a child abuser i said that's what i said he was he was arrested as part of the in the uk a few years ago there was a big thing called operation u tree where uh one celebrity was found out to be a, a child abuse child molester and it sparked off a whole investigation about loads of different celebrities uh and they they, they got onto him when he was basically when he was a at secondary when he was a teacher at secondary school he was accused of uh, going on school trips with pupils and carrying out indecent acts and not on just on school trips because he was a teacher at secondary school. So, yes. Just look up Fred Talbot. You'll you find out. <laughs> uh, usually people like that don't get make it out alive, says Retro Rabbit. Uh, yeah, he probably will. The funny thing was, he got sent to jail for, I think, five years, and then the Scots, because some of the stuff that was supposed to have happened, that was alleged to have happened, happened in Scotland on a school trip. So, the uh, the, the Scots, the one who's in jail, the Scottish said, oh, here's a load of new charges, you're sticking in for another five years. And there you go. <laughs> Chew on that. So he's in there for, I don't know how many years. But yeah. Because it's like, I assume there'll be money. I don't know if there's still money, is it? I think, I assume they sold off his house and other stuff to pay the other costs. So, yeah. what do you do? I say no sympathy at all, but you just ask the question, you know, what happens when you're a celebrity that people recognise in the street and yet you've been in prison for something so bad that they're just going to stone you if you walk past them? Where do you go? What do you do? I don't know. Weird. <sighs> I'm going to read this out, Dave, because you put it in chat and it's kind of open to the public, but no, I won't read it out. You never know. Well, it's on the screen. People have seen it. Dave says, I've been to prison twice for poll tax evasion, got 14 days for the first time, 28 for the second, and I'm now classed as a political activist. Yeah. I don't think you'd have the same issues on the out as, uh, say, a child molester. 
But yeah. You stuck it to the man. Or to the Thatcher. Let's just be accurate. Uh, oh, wow, says Lynn. You hide in your house and never come out, says Lynn. Nah, not if you're a celeb. You don't hide anywhere. And besides, it doesn't have that house anymore. <laughs> I drive past it occasionally. It's like, yeah, you don't live there anymore, do you, mate? Yeah. Nah. Uh, what made it worse? What made it worse as well <clears throat> was that. Um... <coughs> Hang on, I need a swig of water. My throat's going dry again. <clears throat> In the run-up to the trial and everything else, when he was just under investigation, uh, you know, he would say he'd, den he'd deny everything flatly to us and say it's all just made up. It's all mistakes, isn't there? There's no truth to it at all. Yada yada yada. He'd you know come round and. We'd say, you know, because at that point, I, I'm, you know, I, I believe in the just justice process, you know, innocent till proven guilty. So at that point, we had nothing to suggest he was guilty or innocent. We hadn't. So we, he was a family friend. So we, we technically assume innocence until guilt is proven. That's how justice works. That's how jurisprudence works. So we were supportive and said, oh well, you know, they'll sort it. If it's not, if it's not true, then they'll find out and it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. But then, of course, when evidence emerged and when he was found guilty and then it was a case that the, it, there was a program on TV a while ago where they actually showed his interview in the police station in, 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 uh, and he was confronted by the officers, the investigating detectives, with his diary that he wrote himself in which he said stuff that was kind of condemned him, really. And at first he's like, no, I don't recognise that. That's not my diary. I didn't write that. It's nothing to do with me. I don't know what that diary is. Nothing to do with me at all. And then like a complete spoon, he sits there and he goes, oh, look at my spelling. It's atrocious. Loser. So, yeah, when it became really apparent that he was actually guilty, and we were like, yeah, seriously, now you can go and die in a fire because you lied to us. Because, you know, before somebody's, before before that, you assume someone is innocent until proven guilty. But if you're proven guilty and there's evidence that confirms it, yeah, no, that's, you're on the out then. Sorry, bye. So that was, that was a bit annoying. Do, ooh, oh, the, oh paint. Lynn Dipple says, so much for going to Lowe's and buying a shovel to dig up the stickers on my yard and cleaning sweet, 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 let's get more, sweetie's house. Sweetie is Lynn's bird. Then shouty bird. Streety is a right shouty dinosaur. I call the birds in our garden shouty dinosaurs. I said to Mama Fox, I'm going outside to feed the shouty dinosaurs and the idiots. Because all the birds are shouty dinosaurs apart from the wood pigeons, which are idiots. They just are idiots. And the squirrel, which is just Hitler, basically. <laughs> yeah. I like our squirrel. We've got a squirrel in the garden. It's kind of amiable. He likes to hang upside down and barely hang on to the bird feeders to get to his peanuts and things. Uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, I said stick it to the man or Thatcher and Dave said I tried to but she got me fox. I bet that was devastating to your dad says Le oh he, he died by then. My dad had passed away by then so he wouldn't have known about it. Um, but yeah, it was devastating to us because like I say he was a family friend and we had no reason to suspect any of it at all and you know um i say all me and my two brothers we had him as a teacher you know we all had him as a, as a biology teacher at school when he was when he was a teacher there because we all went to the same school um and yeah in a way but it was it was more frustrating that he openly lied to us and and you know solicited our support as friends and we'd supported him, giving him the benefit of the doubt when the doubt was more than actually accurate. So it's like, yeah, you can die in a fire now. And there's not many people in this world that would actually say they need to go and die in a fire. I don't really mean that, obviously. But you know what I mean. You'd wash our hands of him. But a bit harsh to say that, even to him. But wash our hands of someone completely. More tissue because of paint on the gloves. So you never know when you watch one of my streams. You never know. Because I have to talk for three or four hours. Sometimes I just talk inane rubbish. Sometimes I come up with deep stuff because I've got to find something to talk about. And if I run out, I've got to dig into the family archives. You might learn interesting things. Do, 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 do. 
squirrels are awesome, says Retro, uh, uh, especially when eating avocado in avocado skin helmets. <laughs> Do 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 do. Sweetie, oh this, oh I see. Sweetie, the T is silent, so it's just sweetie, as in sweet tweety. I get you. After Tweety Bird on the Looney Tunes. Yes, it's definitely a shouty dinosaur. There is your bird. Like stop a good shout. Gundanium says Bible reference. I would no. I am not a religious man. I have no knowledge of such matters. Paint. Thank you. I have no knowledge of religious things. Uh, Fox fact times and other nonsense. There's always other nonsense. Nonsense is the best kind of nonsense, but other nonsense is awesome. But you told me to go and bore my bottom son of a silly person in an outrageous French accent. What? Is this a Monty Python reference? Oh, wash hands of it. Okay. Just to turn a phrase. I have no knowledge of religious connotations. Dee dee dee. Dry brushing across the Euro. Oh, copyright. Can't sing that. Uh, do, do, do. Uh, I've got a lot of this uh, Evil Sun Scarlet left. I can foresee myself having to pop to the uh, local store, local Warhammer store, to get myself some Evil Sun Scarlet, maybe on Wednesday. Dave says, that would be an ecumenical... Oh, fell off. That would be an ecumenical matter. Yes. It would, it would, it would. I'm not a religious at all. I have no interest in that stuff. Do -do -do. But that's where religion and politics conversation stops. Don't encourage religion and politics in our chat, even though we've done religion and politics now. Never mind, moving on. There you go. Beetle oh. dip. There we go. That's that one done. Uh, we have these little curvy, curvy things. For a pagan, I know a lot about Christianity. Yeah. Oh, look at that big, oh, look at that big, massive dot. Oh. Big black splob of uh, shade on the back there. Look at that. Oh, yeah. You have to go over that a little bit, I think. Shenanigans are the best nonsense. You can't beat some good shenanigans. And I'm sure you'll just leave with one pot of the paint fox, says uh, Daniel Smith. I will, because I'm skint anyway. So it was car remo tea time this month. Uh, I think I said this the other day when I did a stream, but I saved up carefully so that I had enough money. Because last year when I, my car went for its MOT, last year it had like, it failed on a little bit of welding, which I could afford to get fixed. But it had like about a billion advisories. Like this is stuff that's not quite right. You need to, it's not failed on them, but you really want to get them fixed before the next MOT. Like, you know, loose steering rack and things like that. So stuff that you're not going to fail on now, but you should get them seen to. And I totally didn't. So I saved up very carefully this month, uh, this year. Saved up very carefully, so I had a big chunk of money in my bank account, ready, ready for my MOT. So I knew that all the stuff that needed to get fixed last year, I could now afford to get fixed. Uh, and then and just on the same day as my MOT, when I was going to take my car in with this all this money saved up, uh, the RAC took a couple of hundred quid off me. And I'm like, oh, no. But then I thought, well, it's too late now. They've, they've taken that money, you know, for my... my uh, car recovery type stuff oh well let's go in for the mot and see what happens if I've, if I've got like many hundreds of pounds of the repairs to do i'll just have to declare it as off the road and not drive it for a bit and somehow miraculously miraculously the garage said it's it's failed it's past its mot nothing needs doing and i looked at the advisory list and there was nothing on the advisory list so after all that it cost me 45 quid and i don't know how all the stuff that was an advisory last year is now suddenly not a problem. And the guy was like, yeah, it depends on the examiner on the day. Might be in a good mood. Might just not bother about some things. The car may not be exhibiting some problems. It's just, just pay the 45 quid and run. So I did. So, yeah, unfortunately, I've got my, my MOT and my RAC membership on the same damn 
time of year, same month. It's like, oh, that was badly planned, Fox, wasn't it? You didn't plan that very well, did you? So I, I, but I keep forgetting. So I know next year, when it comes to September, I need to save up monies for the MOT in case it needs to have repairs done. And also a couple of hundred quid for me, RA saying, I've got to tell you, having a car is damn expensive. It's a very expensive thing to have. It's not cheap at all. I mean, it wasn't so bad when I had, you know, nine to five job and I was getting a regular pay income, but <laughs> nowadays, yeah, it's kind of expensive. But there you go. Front rabbit fact, I'm a direct descendant of Sir Andrew Barton, uh, circa 1466, the 2nd of August, 1511, Scottish privateer. Yar. According to my dad, who was from Glasgow, we're related to Robert the Bruce, but I'm pretty sure everybody who's Scottish probably says that. So I don't have any great belief in that. Uh, yes. I'm sure every Scot claims they're related to Robert the Bruce. Oh, what the gifty gifts to see yourselves as others see us. Hey. What brand of paint is that, says Gundanium? This is uh, Citadel paints, the Games Workshop paints. I love them. I've got billions of them. They are, if you're doing brush painting and you're using acrylics, they are. To me personally, I, other people may say different, but to me personally, Citadel paints, acrylic paints, are the best. Absolutely the best paints for water, for brushing. B better than Vallejo, uh, billions of miles better than MIG. Um, better than everything else. They're just the nicest ones because they're the most forgiving. And when you're just reg doing regular brushing, um, they do level, self-level beautifully. Uh, they're very forgiving. They don't ball up. As far as acrylic, water-based acrylic paints, in my experience, again, other people may say different, but to me, they're just the absolute... I, I, I'd never been able to brush paint, ever, in my 40 years, uh, until I got some Citadel paints. And suddenly I was like, wait, you mean I can brush paint? Because for a long time I was trying to brush paint with Tamiya paint acrylics, but they're not even acrylics. They're, they're, they're solvent-based, alcohol-based lacquers and they're not designed for brushing so i thought it was me but it wasn't with the paints so i tried other water-based paints and they were all right there were some vallejo paints that i really like but i've never enjoyed painting brush painting as much as since i got these so yes yeah, they paints not cheap and they come in silly little pots but for brush painting they are just the best water-based acrylics and i've tried i've tried many others and though many paints are good but I've never actually had such good results with any others apart from these. I've had the best results with these, let's just say that. Yeah, don't take my word for it, though. I mean, don't assume that I'm correct. This is my opinion based on my experience of other paints. But you might find other paints better for you. Uh, Retro says, my middle name is Barton. My mum's maiden name is Barton. How you don't, how you don't, how do you know you didn't just make a big bridge like the Barton Bridge? That's a Manchester thing. Uh... Yeah, you probably are. See, my surname is Wolf, but that won't help you at all with my history because it's not my wasn't my birth surname. So there you go. <laughs> Another fun fox fact. Uh, Gundanium size. I mostly use testers enamel. I like the bottles. Enamels are nice paints for airbrushing. They're not really good paints for brushing. Um, practicality wise, because the they've got an un unpredictable drying time and they don't self-level like acrylics but on the other hand of course for weathering they're absolutely fantastic because they take longer to dry um, so for things like streaking effects and oil effects and if you look at most weathering products like like the ammo stuff like the streaking grimes and the chipping grimes and stuff like that they're all enamels and they're brilliant panel line washes i wouldn't actually paint with enamels though but the difference i think if you're in the UK, because you got you say testers, so I'm going to guess you're in the US. Here in the UK, um, people my age, we grew up painting kits with enamel paints in the 70s, and they were terrible. So we kind of moved away from those. But it depends what you're doing with them. Like I say, for this kind of effect, if I was just spraying this, and I wasn't doing any weathering, then enamels would be fine. Brilliant. You can get some really nice matte, smooth finishes with enamels. Um, but for any kind of brushing, I wouldn't. Apart from little, little tiny details here and there. I don't know why I took that off for. Kenneth says he's loving Scale 75 paints at the moment. I love the finish for painting stuff. 
uh, to look shiny. Are they the, they're the ones with the massive, massive, massive matte as well, aren't they? When they dry, brush them on, they go out really matte. Uh, I've not tried those yet. Some paints are just hard to get over here. Like, we don't get testers paints over here. Not at all. Uh, we don't get Rust-Oleum, Rattle Cans, I don't think. I don't think we get Scale 75. We might do. I think we can get, like, Privateer Press and P3 Paints, but I don't know how commonly they might not be able to. Uh, we can get Mr. Hobby. Uh, we can, unfortunately, get Ravel and Humbrol Paints. We we'll try not to talk about those. Uh, what else do we get? Yeah, there's some stuff we don't get. Gaia Notes. We can, some places can pick them up. Oh, ping. That made me jump then. What you didn't see was me go, whoo, like that, like a frightened schoolgirl. That actually physically made me jump up in my chair. Oh, it's not going to go on now, is it? That's just, oh. I've got to be careful not to snap any little attachment points off. I don't want to break anything. But it needs to be on both sides because it's a bit you can see through. Right, just grab it there. There you go. Now, don't ping off when you're in the other side of the room and I'm painting things. Uh, let's have a look. This is a little bottle, and yep, says Scandanium. I started painting in the, with enamels in the, in the 70s, says Lint. Yep, you and every British school children in the 1970s. Yep. When I was a kid, painting a model was tiny, tiny pots of Humbrol enamels and a big bottle of white spirit or purple meths. So everything stank. And also, the paint finish was terrible because they never dried. And you had a crappy Humbrol brush. Uh, do do I need to get my hair sorted out. I thought the fox's streaking in grime was good. Oh, I like a nice streak in grime. Lacquers, says Retro Rabbit. Oh, God. Yeah, lacquers. I would love to airbrush lacquers. Because they dry instantly and they give you a really fine, smooth finish. But other people live in this house. And I don't have an industrial extraction system. So, yeah. And I use this room for other things apart from the model making. So, yeah, not going to happen. Do, 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 do. American Fox. What's American? What? Gundanium says, however, Gund wow, hello, words. Gundanium says, however, I like the Mr. Hobby Metallics. However, if I'm painting a warm 100 scale, I mix my own colours and get them just right. Yeah, nothing wrong with that at all. Do you, um, do you like mix them in a separate bottle? I tend to do things like, I've done it here, but I didn't need to, but I always, I've got like a lot of like cheap disposable dropper bottles. So if I'm mixing a custom colour, I'll make sure that I mix a whole mess more than I need. Because the worst thing you can do, the worst thing, when I do the Perfect Grey Millennium Falcon, you'll see me do it. I'll mix my own custom colour for it, which is uh, four, four lots of Tamiya flat white to one lot of Tamiya deck tan, I think, if I remember rightly, for that kind of uh, Millennium Falcon colour. But what I'll do is I'll literally mix it. I won't need that much, but I will literally mix four pots of flat white and one pot of deck tan into a container, and then I'll decant it into little dropper bottles. Because, like I say, I won't need that much. But I don't want to run out halfway through. Because the worst thing you can do when you're mixing custom colours uh, is run out halfway through. Because good luck trying to get that exact mix the next time. Yeah, it's not going to happen. That's why I like using a wet palette for normal brush painting. Because if I do a little custom mix, at least on a wet palette, it might last a while. I'm not going to suddenly have to come back the next day and mix a load more paint. So, yeah. Always mix more than you need, look much more. It's better to throw paint away than to have a model where the colour changes halfway across because you can't can't quite mix the same colour again. Uh, but to that model, I'm a fan of the Mr. Hobby Aqu uh, Aquius uh, through the airbrush. Yep, yeah, Mr. Hobby are good paints. Just have to make sure you know whether you've got the Aquius Hobby colour, which is the water-based ones, or the Mr. Hobby colour, which are lacquer-based, because never the twain should meet, <laughs> as we all know. As we all know. Should never combine that. I actually saw someone who didn't realise that mix a colour that was both. It used some Mr. Hobby Aqueous colours and it used some of the lacquer colours. Yeah, that didn't end well. Oh, itchy nose. Uh, lacquer would kill sweetie, says uh, Lynn. Yeah. If you've got 
I've said it before, but the thing with lacquer paints is they are horribly toxic and nasty. And it's not just that they smell bad. I mean, all paints are toxic if you inhale them, but with lacquers, if you can smell it, you are damaging your lungs because they're, they're noxious, volatile, organic chemicals, VOCs. Over here in the UK, the, the VOCs are licensed. Um, you know, it's the same paints that they use in body shops, which is why they wear full face masks and have respirators and stuff. If you're spraying lacquers, you have to have a respirator. Absolutely. You have to have extraction, preferably very, very good extraction. But if you're working in a bedroom or a spare room or something like that, and you may have a respirator, that's fine. You may have a little cheap spray booth like we've all got. Again, that's fine. But if there's other people in the house, don't use lacquers. Or even animals, other people or pets. Because you're stood there with your respirator on and that's nice because when you finish spraying you've got your spray booth go and you finish spraying you you clean out your airbrush you turn off the spray booth and you go downstairs or go to a different room and you watch telly for a bit that's fine but the animal that lives in that room like that bird or the cat or the dog they can't wear a respirator and they can't move out the room necessarily they're going to breathe all that in if you can smell it you're doing harm so yeah, if you've got animals, anything like that, and you're not spraying outdoors in a, you know, like a shed or something, just don't do it indoors. Think of other people. As Kenneth says, and I always say, if you smell it, you will die. Yeah, the the the, the fume, just the fumes alone, can do you a lot of damage. Which is why, no matter what you spray, whether it's acrylics, lacquers, enamels, I don't care what paint it is. You don't ever, ever, ever spray with a, a dust mask. You spray, only ever spray with a respirator. Especially with lacquers, because even the fumes are, are dangerous. Because you will, if, if you're, uh, it's like, that's one of the ways you know that your filters need changing on your respirator. If you're spraying paint and you can, you've got a mask on, like a respirator, and you can smell that paint, you, you need to change your filters straight away and stop spraying. Because if you can smell the paint, your respirator isn't doing the job. So I can't stress that enough with lacquers. If you share a house, if you live on your own and it's like, you know, if you're living by yourself and there's no one else in the house, then spray your lacquers, have extraction, have a respirator, spray the lacquers, keep the mask on, leave the room, close the door, keep the fan going, keep the window open, close the door and then take off your respirator and then don't go in the room for a couple of hours. You'll be fine. If you share a house with anybody, just don't. Don't use lacquers. Ever. Are we talking about paint or dad's fart, says Butcher that model. Yeah, same same as. Same as. Either or. Uh, respirator equals good thing, says Gundanium. Yeah, there's no reason to ever not have a respirator. I've seen people use rattle cans indoors with no respirator. And I'm like, do you actually want your entire family to die? Because seriously, just go outside with that nonsense. Bearing in mind that rattle cans tend to be lacquers as well. That's why you never... The other rest the thing with rattle cans, you never spray rattle cans indoors anyway because it's dumb. Uh, Avak says, hello, thanks. Hey, Avak, welcome, welcome. I hope I pronounced that right. Do, 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 do. Just remember, by the way, anybody watching who's, who's new to this nonsense, uh, do remember to subscribe. Become a subscriber to the channel. Hit the subscribe button. Don't forget, of course, do hit the notification bell if you haven't already. I've got a lot of dry brushing to do on this kit and a lot of decals and other things where I'm going to be doing live streaming while I'm painting it. And I'm trying to do it not off camera either. Um, so even if you're a subscriber, make sure you've hit the notification bell so that next time I start a live stream, some of them I'm posting up on Facebook and Twitter and stuff and Instagram and Ello to say, I'm going to be streaming in 10 minutes, but some of them I might not get a chance. I might just start the stream. So if you've got the notification bell pressed, uh, then you'll always know when I start a stream. Paul Di Tommaso is laughing at the phrase bottom burps, which is a British euphemism for farting. And just in case there's anybody out there in the US who hasn't realised this. Uh, not that I'm getting into politics, but just so you know. Trump is a British slang word for fart. 
just so you know and we'll leave that one there we're not, we're not doing political commentary here but just so you know trumping is farting so yeah never gonna take that one seriously just so you know a lot of people a lot of american people didn't know that i've said it to a lot of people like oh, i never knew that's hilarious so there you go but yeah bottom burp but but trumpet is kind of the american version of bottom burp i guess Diddly diddly diddly. Kev Lawson says, oh hi Kev, says, what shocked me in some groups are pictures of people spraying into cardboard boxes without a mask, everything just going back into the face, yeah, it... rattle can or even airbrush, nothing amazes me more, if you ever want to understand why you need a respirator, even if you've got a spray booth, um, next time you use your spray booth, have a light above the spray booth, say above and just pointing at the spray booth opening, and then do your spraying, but have, have the rest of the room a bit dark, perhaps. And then watch. Because even with the spray booth, if you're doing some heavy spraying with an airbrush, you'll see clouds of, of, of paint vapour coming up at the top of the spray booth. It will eventually go back in, it'll get sucked in, but you'll see that as you're spraying, you spray on the model, the, the, depending on what you're spraying, the paint can like blap off the model and reflect back off and up into the air. It doesn't all just go straight into the, the sucky bit of the spray but some of it comes up so yeah you, you will see clouds of this mist rolling out of your spray booth and that stuff if you haven't got a respirator you're breathing in and if you have got one but no somebody else in the house might be breathing in and not all of it's going to go into the spray booth so that's why ideally when you do any kind of spraying if you if i do spraying i tend to do it in one big long session uh, and when i've finished i leave the room for a couple of hours I don't necessarily leave the spray booth on for a couple of hours because it's quite loud, loud and the neighbours would get knocked off with it. But I do tend to leave the room for a couple of hours. I leave the window open, even in the middle of winter, just to let the air circulate out. I'll leave the fan on while I'm cleaning the airbrush because I'll finish my spraying, clean the airbrush, leave the fan on so it's sucking stuff out of the room. And I'll, then I'll finish all that, take my respirator off, go out the room, turn the fan off, go out the room and leave it for an hour or more. If it's acrylics, I'll leave it for about an hour. If, it, if I, I have very, very occasionally, I've sprayed lacquers because I've had to. And I've literally sprayed them for like 10 or 15 minutes. And I've just left the room for a couple of hours after that. Uh, did that start before he came present or after? It says William Milms. No, the word Trump in Britain, the word Trump has meant fart for like forever. It's always meant fart. It's just another word for fart to Trump. So the fact that, you know, you've now got a president called fart, we find hilarious. It's always been a word. It's very, very old word that. It's nothing to do with him at all. <laughs> paint on the finger, thank you, Citadel. God damn you, sir. Luckily, it's red paint on red, so I'm not too fussed. If I catch it quick enough, I can rub it off. <sighs> God damn it, Games Workshop. It's all gravy. It's all going to get weathered and chipped anyway, so it's fine. Uh, I tend to spray outside when it doesn't rain, as it's good humidity and temperature. Yep, if you've got, if you're ever going to use a rattle can, then always, always, always do it outside anyway, or do it in a shed or garage. But if you're doing it in somewhere enclosed like that, wear a respirator. If you just go out in the garden and spray, you don't need to wear a respirator, as long as you don't stand in the cloud of stuff and huff it all in. Like I'll, I, when I rattle can, I'll go in the garden and do it, uh, and I'll just, I'll be as quick as I can. I'll go down to the end of the garden, but I will keep in mind. Um, that if next door's little boy is out in the garden playing on his on his on his climbing frame and stuff, which is at the same part of the garden where I do my spraying, same end of the garden, if he's out jumping around his trampoline and climbing up his wooden fort thing and stuff, I won't spray because I don't know which direction the wind's going to blow the spray. I and mean, even when you go outside, you get a lot of rattle cans. It's like a hose pipe, so you will get a lot of blowback and a lot of spray. So if the little boy next door is in his garden playing, I won't spray. I'll wait till he goes inside. Or if, you know, the other neighbour's having a barbecue or something. Yeah, you be kind of thoughtful to your neighbours. If you're going like a shed or a garage or something, that's fine. Just You will want to wear a respirator then. Uh, but that model says, Trump is English slang for fart. It comes from elephants trumpeting as the noise is sometimes the same. Yeah, it's a very old slang word. Trudeau is Latin for racially insensitive dork with nice socks, says Retro Rabbit. <laughs> I just read that out. We're not doing politics. <laughs> yes. Uh, also, Trump card. Very old. There was also a game called Top Trumps. 
because to trump someone is to beat them as well it's a, it's a word meaning to trump well you know that anyway if you trump someone you beat them so top trumps was a game where you'd have a, a deck of cards each card would have like a thing that like for example sports cards or sports personalities or something and they'd have like a, a selection of seven or eight different statistics and each card would have the same so you'd have a pile of cards each and you play by just comparing them and whoever had the if one of you read out a stat like this car has got a v8 engine and the other one would say well mine's got a v12 ah that wins so i take that card off you uh, Lynn Dipple says, if I can't get my extractor fan hose into the window, I'm going to have to go outside. Don't forget, though, Lynn, uh, a lot of people, if you can't get it out the window, um, a lot of these spray booths, they actually just use bog standard extractor hoses from washing machines. Like the one I've got, it's the same, exactly the same. It's not a, it's not a washing machine extractor hose, hose even, but it's exactly the same size on the round end uh, because the tubes are just generic outlet tubes. So if you need to, what you could do is get um, an outlet put onto the wall and just have that tube, like a, like an extractor fan hole on the wall, but you just connect the tube in. Like you would with the washing machine. It has a, a washing machine has the tube going out to the hole on the wall. Do that. So I need to wipe my nose again. So you don't need a window necessarily. You can just have an extraction outlet. Yon's car says I don't spray at home if my mum's home because it goes to her head. She often has the window open. Yeah, and that's the thing. If you spray paint, and like Eel says, if you spray his paint, his mum goes a bit woozy. She's inhaling toxic chemicals. She's 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 being harmed. So he rightfully doesn't spray if she's home. Or you know, for example, if I'm if I'm spraying up here, if I'm going to spray something that is potentially quite stinky, I buy. The thing is with, with paints, if it stinks more, it hurts more. The more stinky it is, the more dangerous it is. If I, for example, I'm going to paint, I've got some Mr. Metal Colour uh, lacquers. If I need to paint those, I will do. But I will, of course, do mask. I'll have extraction. I'll close this door to this room and I'll uh, I'll just make sure Mama Fox doesn't come upstairs for any reason. Or keep this door shut. I will, but it's very limited. So, But if I was doing it all the time, no, I wouldn't do it. do 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 Uh, Dave says we have about 20 different sets of top trumps. My Tommy loves it. Yeah, it's a good it's a good kids card game. Especially when you don't know anything about the the I was saying on the show last night. Uh we used to play top trumps as kids in the 70s and 80s, but we always we always had things like the top trump sports car set. We didn't know anything about cars, but we'd still assume that we knew it a thing about the facts. So we'd always say that like we kind of roughly knew that for most of them, a bigger number was better. So brake horsepower, if you had 200 and I had 500, I win because I've got the bigger number. We didn't really know what brake horsepower was. We, In fact, we didn't even know what BHP was. We didn't even know what BHP was. We just knew if the number was bigger, it was better. Which got a bit weird when you did things like 0 to 60 and then we'd be like, the bigger number is better. So my 0 to 60 is two seconds and my seven, so I win. Yeah, not not quite, but hey, we were little kids. Uh, so look, uh, Lynn says, but I really want to put a hole in the wall. Not really. Well, I mean, if you're going to have a spray booth there permanently, I mean, like I say, it's it's no different to having one put in the wall where you have a washing machine outlet. Um, so I don't know how you'd, how you'd want to do it really a lot of people have them I wouldn't say do it yourself but I'll get somebody to do it but yeah, a lot of people have them especially if you spray booth I mean the other option is just to make sure your spray booth is near a window your spray booth can be away from your workbench I mean mine's a pain because mine's just there but it takes up workbench space and actually reaching my spray booth, I have to lean right across the desk and it's not exactly comfortable to use, but I can't put it anywhere else because it needs to be near the window for the tube to go out. But I can't have it like encroaching onto the main work area of the desk because then I have it encroaching onto the main area of the desk. <laughs> Lynn says, do I really want to put a hole in the wall? Not really, but then it is my house. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Beck Storm is in. Welcome back. 
Uh, Dave has a question, but I'll get to that in a second. I'll just do this dry brushing bit here. I think dinner tonight might be McDonald's. I think. I don't know. It might be. Mama Fox said she might fancy McDonald's. And trust me, when you've had a dodgy belly, you want McDonald's just to stod you up. Uh, Dave says, question. He says, ah, uh, question. I'm moving the man cave this week to the third floor bedroom. Ooh, third floor. I'll get you with your poncy third floor, three floor house. With a chimney breast. Could I drill into it and fit a tumble dryer flame thingy pipe over the holes and connect my hose to it? Could I drill into it? Do you mean have do you mean have the entire chimney tube as an extraction tube so the stuff just goes up the chimney? Um Dunno. You might just find all the stuff just floats around in the chimney breast. Because the thing about chimney breast is the reason they work is because the air from a fire is hot and the air rises up through the chimney. Paint vapour doesn't tend to be hot and it's heavier than air, so it might not go anywhere. I would say stick it through a window, lad. Stick it through a window or drill a little hole in your wall. You just wanted to write the word breast in the chat, didn't you? And have me read it out. It's the entire reason for that entire comment. Yeah, I, I wouldn't count on the chimney to extract the vapours for you because, like I say, smoke from a fire is hot and rises. Uh, paint vapours is heavier than air and doesn't. So I don't think it would suck the paper out for you. I know the, the spray booth will be sucking the air out, but the spray booths we've got, they're not that powerful. I mean, I, I highly doubt mine's even sucking that much paint out anyway. But it's better than nothing. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't make that assumption. Doo -doo -doo. You need a lot of airflow to push the particles and gas up there, says uh, Beckstrom. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the fans we've got on our spray booths, they're barely enough to get the paint through the foam with a with a bit of paint on it. it I doubt mine even works that much. So I don't think it would work because it's got to go, what, 10, 15 feet? Yeah, it's not it's not going to do that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, take that risk. So not unless you had a, a fire lit in the fireplace to then make the updraft, but then of course you've got the issue of it would explode and you'd die. So that's probably not a, bad, a good idea either. No, I'd... I'd Get through a window or if you need to, if Pip would allow it, get a thing put on the wall, hole it wall. There must be a window you can put your spray booth near. Ultimately, the easiest thing is just to put your spray booth near to the window and, and work the rest, arrange the rest of the room around that. Make that the first thing you plan because the workbench can go anywhere in the room, but the spray booth kind of has to be near the window if you need a window. So, do 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 do. I wanted a gold frame using Mr. Metallic DX on a 1-100 scale Kimaris. Kima oh, what is a... I stopped watching uh, Gumpler TV when Sid left because it went downhill. But I didn't have a problem with... Uh, what's his name? Ben, what was his name? The young lad. Anyway, every time I see Kimaris, I, all I can hear in my head is... Was it Rob? Rod? Whatever his name was. In my, all I can hear is him going, Kimaris Trooper. I don't know why. He just said it once and it's stuck in my brain. So whenever I hear Kimaris now, I can never hear him say, Kimaris Trooper. In that bizarre, slightly Canadian sounding voice. Yeah, I stopped watching that when, when Sid left because it, it just went down. It used to be fun to watch. Then they started standing up all the time and it was like, really? And then it was just gash. So I gave up. Um, but he went through three bottles of it of the Mr. Metallic DX, uh, costing him fifteen dollars US to airbrush the thing. Yeah, those metallic paints like that can be expensive. Right, I think that is. Oh no, 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 no. We've got a couple of last little bits to do. Ten are we on? Ten past five. <clears throat> a couple of last little tiny bits I need to do, uh, which I'll do now, and then we'll call it a show. We have. Uh, there are a couple of bits I've, I've not done the shield you'll notice and that's because I'm keeping the shield to one side because that's been used for the filming of the actual video build series the, the patreon exclusive video build series of this this is just the this is the free stuff because I'm just doing dry brushing so yeah there you go uh, no, 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 no. And I'm not filming that episode yet so we've got the torso area here I have assembled and pre-assembled some bits because I'm fairly confident I can ooh, too much paint 
I'm fairly confident I can get the next few bits done without these having to be separated. And I'm trying to minimise the amount of bits I've got on sticks. Because it's it's got rid I can't have like all the yellow and all the red on sticks because I haven't got enough sticks. So at the moment I'm just trying to minimise it. If I can get something onto the model and do everything I need to do, like dry brushing and chipping and stuff, then I'll do that. So that's why I've got this red armour on here, like this, you see? Do, do, do. Now it's taken me, what, about two, three hours to get this first coat of dry brushing done for the red. I've got to go back with the squig orange yet and do it all again. But there'll be less to do because it's a smaller area. I was about to say something as well and I've totally forgotten what I was about to say. I've got no idea. Uh... <laughs> You could get some industrial grade centrifugal extraction for a fan in there or a decent strength one and clamp it to a ducting pipe, says Beck, and shove the pipe all the way up the chimney. You, yeah, I mean, that's the other option. If you're going to use a chimney stack and you do actually put in some massive, like you said, industrial grade sucky tubes with fans that will suck the vapours up, then that's one option, but that's going to cost you a fortune. You may as well just stick it out of a window and not spend hundreds and hundreds of pounds or several thousand pounds on a massive extraction system just 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 put it near a window there you go lad uh, i no longer thin metallic colors and stick to hand painting them says gundanium if you're using things like the mr metal paints because they're lacquers you don't actually need to thin them at all I've got the uh, Vallejo metal colour paints. I've got not the full range, but I've got loads of these. Loads of different ones. I've got about five or six. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've got about eight or nine of them, I think, uh, in various metallic shades. And they're so thin. They're like water. They're beautiful to brush on because you don't need to thin them at all. Don't put them. Don't put them on a wet palette because that'll be sadness because they're, they're already thin enough. You don't need to thin them. You don't even need a wet palette. Next door puts up a picture of something that I can't quite see what it is, and then says, if anyone finds Fox's brain, and Lynn says, sorry, if anyone finds Fox's brain flying around, please catch it and give it back to him. No, don't. You know what? Life's much more fun with that one. Especially at the moment. In the world we live in today, I'd much rather have no brain at all. And just bumble along doing my little happy things. Painting my happy little gumplers and my happy little warhammers. And not think about anything. Yeah, so I can do all this dry brushing on these bits, no problem. I'm not getting any red paint on the grey inner frame parts. So I don't have to be particularly careful. It's kind of, it's all gravy. Let's lift that up a little bit and do a little bit on here. Burba, 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 so. There you go. I had to do bulba, didn't I? I can't not do it. Do, 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 do. If I paint a kettle, completely take it apart, then put it back together. The DX line is thicker than the metallic line. Ah, okay. I'm not familiar with the DX that much. Didn't realise they were thicker. Do, 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 do. Uh, normally I would, in the past, I have painted Gumpler with every single part separate on stick. Uh, but the difference with this, uh, the, but I, I, I'll be blatantly honest with people, I gave up the will to live doing that because I got fed up of having things on sticks and having to fart about and be delicate and then you put it all together whilst pooping kittens because you've got to make sure half the paint doesn't come off when you move anything so i actually gave up on doing that and what i do now and going forward is i'm building basically fixed pose gumpler i'm fed up of being either doing careful paint jobs that come off when you move something or because a joint moves or having to be super careful and stressing about hang on if i paint this but is this going to fit back together and then if i do that and i move the arm and then i try to put it together and that comes off and then the paint scrapes and ah uh, i suddenly realize you know what why don't i just treat it like a normal model build it in a fixed pose where the joints are glued and it's in a fixed pose that can never change and then i can just paint it like a normal model so some of it's on sticks some of it's just like this I, I can i can paint these armor parts now and weather them without them having to be separate from the rest of it so i'll always try and get the most sub assemblies i can because there's no point making work for yourself there's absolutely no point making unnecessary extra work for yourself 
I mean, I'll still paint the inner frame, even though a lot of it's going to be covered up. But that's kind of different. But yeah, gone are the days when I'm like, I'm stressing and almost losing sleep at night because I'm trying to plan how to paint X, Y, and Z, knowing that as soon as I move anything, all the joints are going to scrape and the paint's going to come off. And then how am I going to hide that? Uh, Swig and Pig says, got to go. Bye all. Thanks for coming in, Swig and Pig. We'll be finishing shortly. I've just got a last little bit to do. This brush is looking right spiky now. Uh, Lynn says, bye, Swing. Swig, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, night, night. Beck Storm says, so can you just airbrush lacquer straight onto an unprimed kit? Just the thinnest to worry about, right? Uh, no. Well, you can. But what you'll find is the paint will just come straight back off. Because you know the golden rule? Always, 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 always prime. If you don't particularly want the paint to stay on the model, then you don't have to prime it. But it will all come back off again as soon as you handle it. Even lacquers, which are durable. Paint doesn't stick to plastic. Primer does. There's no excuse for not priming your kit. Unless you're doing like a simple details only paint job like i did my um gear at my gear zulu that was a simple beginner paint job where it was like we're not going to paint it we're just going to paint on some little details here and there that's fine you, you don't have to use it i mean there's nothing you're not doing anything wrong if you decide to prime it but what you'll find is the paint won't stick and it will come off and you may also get surface tension issues because paint struggles if you've ever tried painting onto a glossy surface you'll see the paint has surface tension and beads up and pulls away same thing with plastic. Sometimes it's just too shiny. Now, there can be some benefits to painting, say, especially in the frame parts. Uh, if you look at the the, the unicorn, master grade unicorn I did, or didn't finish, but did. Or if you look at the, uh, like I said, the Gear Rosula again, have a look at that. That was deliberately just painting on little details in metallics on the inner frame without actually priming the frame because the frame was the right color and I'm only painting little details. And that can be quite good fun because if you paint, say I'm doing the inner frame and I paint a little bit with a metallic colour or any colour and I haven't primed it and I go a bit wrong, you know what you can do? You can scrape it off with a cocktail stick. If I want to paint, say, a straight line here and then this wasn't primed and I went like that with the paint, I could scrape it away with a cocktail stick and get it back to a nice straight edge and it looked brilliant. I'm going to go lightly on this bit here because this has got some dusting over it. So I'm not going to do too much on these red parts. They will get more dusting later on. I'm going to do a quick blap of the red on these nut joints. But these are meant to look a bit more grubby and dirty because it's part of the inner frame. So, And I know it's difficult to get on camera as well. But this is why I'm not painting the armour on the leg because I've got this leg glued into a pose but it's not the most fixed pose in the world. It's still a bit ropey. So I don't need to be handling this too much, this part. So we'll put that back over there. Get it mounted back on its base. You go in there like that, you see? Little hole, little peg, there you go, no you don't. Ooh, hang on, hang on. Can't find me all. There it is, there it is. There we go. No we don't. Yes, no we don't. Yes it is, no it isn't. There we go. Right, so that is, I think, done those, done those. That's all the red armor. Yes. That is all the red armor. Uh, yes, you always, always, always prime. Purely because, like I say, uh, paint will not stick very well to plastic. It has no adhesive properties. It has no etch properties. It will not stick chemically or mechanically to, to plastic. If you, I mean, I've got models that I painted when I was a kid and they were primed and they were brush painted and there's paint still on them. But, you know, that was Tamiya paints many years ago and they've been in a cabinet for 40 years 30 years so yeah but if it's not it's not worth it if you're going to put if you're going to put hours and hours and hours and hours you can invest a lot of time into painting a model why would you why would you skip the step that stops the paint coming off especially if you're going to be handling it and painting it you're just going to come straight off so always prime it primers basically bond to the plastic in one of two ways mechanically like, for example, uh, polyurethane-based primers, which effectively create like a coat of polyurethane-based paint over the part. So it, it locks onto it physically, but it's not sticking to it. It's just like it's on there. If I've got this object here and I cover it in primer, the primer is then mechanically 
locked on. It's gripping onto it physically. Uh, it forms a skin, which will eventually come off if you force it hard enough, but it's, it's on more than paint would do. Uh, or you've got etch primers, which are more automotive, but they chemically bond with the plastic. They either etch a little bit of the surface plastic away and eat into it to give it a rough toothy finish, and that's how it sticks, and then it sticks mechanically. Or they just chemically bond with the plastic. So, But they, they're basically a primer just gives you a surface to paint on. Uh, if you try and paint on clear, on just unprimed plastic, primer gives you a rough coat. The paint can grip and stay on. If you paint onto plastic, the plastic is smooth. The surface tension, it'll either try and bead up. You may get coverage where it just comes off. It, it goes into little separate balls. It doesn't quite work. There's, there's nothing to stick on. So always, 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 unless you're doing like a little quick silly budget build like I did, where you're just brush painting on some details and that's it for a fun little project. If you're going to spend hours and hours painting a model, prime it, prime everything. Especially if it's a Gunplot or Bandai kit and you intend on doing any kind of enamel pin washes or anything like that later on. If you don't prime the plastic and any kind of thinners get in there, you're screwed. So, yeah. So, yes. Uh, Lynn says, you've made Dad cry, no more painting. Oh, don't worry, this, I've got Squig Orange to yet, which is technically red. So that'll be next time, will be the Squig Orange layer. Uh, do 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 Kenneth says, primer gives you a uniform colour and surface for your paint too. Yeah, it's true. Uh, if you get a kit like a Bandai kit with 18 different colours, plastics, and you're trying to colour it all, colour it all a colour, you'll get different shades. If, I, if I've got like black, blue and yellow plastic and I paint, say, a, a green colour over the top, that green's going to look different depending on what's underneath it. So again, prime it. Just prime it. There's no reason not to prime it. Prime, 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 prime. And if you don't prime and all the paint comes off your kit when, you, when you're putting it together, it, uh, or it peels off when you're doing weathering, you've got no one to blame but yourself. Because let's not forget, some of these weathering steps are a bit aggressive later on. It's a bit like building the world's most advanced racing car, but building it on, like, you know, you've just built the world's most advanced Formula One car, but you've given it a wooden chassis. It's going to last about 10 foot gonna last about five minutes it will just explode so it's like building it's like building a house it's like spending a million pounds building the house of your dreams but you just build it without any foundations and within a year it's gone into the ground and all your things are squashed and the mother-in-law has been absorbed by the world yeah you just it's gonna be sadness prime it prime it there's no excuse no excuse if you've got an airbrush prime it if you're not got an airbrush get rattle cam primers if you haven't got rattle cam primers, get an airbrush or rattle cam primers. There's just no excuse. No excuse. I say it might be fine. Like I said, I've got a, I've got a Jeep I made when I was 15, uh, and it's still got the paint on it, and it's never come off. But then it's been in the cabinet for 30 years, and if I started moving it around all the time, it probably would eventually start peeling off. <sighs> Let's have a look. Um, Beck Storm says, "Yeah, I'm thinking about the inner frame. I don't want to have to prime the inner frame. Make things easy." Um, if you don't want a million parts on sticks, do like me, pre-assemble. Do a, do a fixed pose, like I said before. I know you can't see it, but if I move the camera a bit and break everything, huh? that's the lower inner frame for the uh, for the Sazabi. That was built like this, primed, and then painted. So I haven't got 48 bits on sticks. I've got one thing, the hip and the legs, because the knees and the hips, are, well, the hips aren't really glued that well, but the knees are glued in place, the feet are glued in place, nothing can move. I've just assembled that and because none of that needs to be moving. So as long as I can get to it all with a paintbrush or to do a painting and weathering, I don't need to have a million things on sticks. I've just got one big thing that I can paint. So always think about that, especially with Gumpler, because you have this pressure with Gumpler. You think, well, it's, it's articulated and it's got all the movable arms and therefore it seems wrong to get rid of that. It doesn't at all, because think logically about it. What are you going to do with it? That looks delicious. I don't know what that is. Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to build it. You're going to paint it. You're going to put it in your cabinet and never touch it again. You're not going to be sitting there doing posing all the time. Because if you start doing posing, you are just going to pull all the paint off the joints. So there's no point giving yourself a hundred things on sticks uh, to carefully paint and prime when you're never going to move it. You may as well just glue all the, the limbs in place, like in the pose you want. Get, like build, basically build the inner frame. Here's how I do it. I build the inner frame. 
I get it in a pose that I want. Uh, so I'll get the legs and arms in, get it in the pose I want, and then I'll carefully separate the, the torso with the arms and stuff and the legs. I'll make sure it's in the same pose. I will then make sure that I can remove the armor in that pose. So carefully take the armor off without destroying the pose and then glue all the inner frame in place. The reason I do that that way is because the last thing you want to do is put an arm in, say that, make an arm that's like that in a say crooked elbow like that. So he's, he's holding something, glue it all together and then find that you can't get the inner, the arm apart on because it's in a funny pose. So you need to make sure that when the arm's in the pose you want or the leg, that you can get the armor on and off. If you can take the armor off, glue all the joints, done. That's one thing you can paint. That's one thing on a stick rather than 35 things on a stick much faster and the thing is you're still going to put it in your cabinet it's going to look fantastic you're never going to change the pose anyway we're not going to be, we don't play with these things if again it's the same thing if you're going to invest 20 30 40 100 hours in in painting something trust me you spend 50 hours painting a gundam you are not going to repose that sucker ever it's going to go in the cabinet and get an occasional dust why then not just glue it in that pose and then you can just do like one thing rather than 15 Try and think in sub-assemblies like that. Try and minimise it down. Just make sure that you're not gluing the leg or the arm in a pose and suddenly you can't get the armour on. That's the worst thing you can do. Chronoman says, I left models unprimed when I was having first attempts at battle damage painting so that when I screw it up, it's easier to remove the paint. Yeah, you can just scrape it off. Like I say, and don't forget as well, if it's a Gumpler, if, if, it's, like, if it's like a high grade or something, or even if it's a master grade, you can if you want. If you're not gonna if you're not gonna play with it and pose it and stuff with the inner frame there's nothing wrong with like i said before not priming it because it's kind of inner frame color not priming it and painting some of the details like some of the metallic bits gold and silver and stuff like whatever you want to do and then you can matte varnish it now it is going to be yes there's no primer on there and if you handle it excessively that paint may well just peel off but given that fact with in, with that fact in mind uh, it can still look pretty good, even if it's just matte varnish and a couple of little detail parts. There's no harm in it. It'll look fine. I've done that on that, on that Gara Zulu. But, and then you, obviously you might want to properly paint the armour on the outside, because that might look a bit better. But for the inner frame, you could get away with that, as long as you don't start handling it all the time. Because you know in your mind there's no primer on there. It might come off. The paint might come off. So just be careful with it. But I would say if you're going to do a proper paint job on the armour, you might as well do a proper paint job on the inner frame. Uh, okay, I'll prime, says Beckstorm. <laughs> He's been nagged. <laughs> uh, Lynn Dipple says, I use Tamir Rattle Can and UMP Primer to handbrush. Uh, Tamir Rattle Can Primer is probably the best Rattle Can Primer you can get. It's a lacquer primer and it's as durable as old nails. It's tough as old nails. It's super, super thin and it's super, super hardcore. It's great for Gumpler because it's so fine. You don't tend to clog up um, joints. If you're brushing your primer on, like the UMP stuff, they are very good as brushed on. You can brush them on, especially on minis and things. Uh, but for anything that's like got lots of big open areas, it might be better to airbrush it or just use a rattle cam primer if you've not got an airbrush. UMP primer is really good and the other ones you can brush them. If on a gumpler, it will really clog up your joints. If you if you prime all the bits by brush and then put them all together, you'll find everything's a really tight fit because you, you by brushing it, you put on a thick coat of, of, of primer. So if you've got a, joints and movable things, you might want to airbrush those or rattle cam them. I like seam lines as it represents where the armour was welded after repairs have been done. Personal preference when it comes to pose or not pose. Yeah, true. Uh, the, the, the other thing you can do as well with like, if you've got like two pieces of armour that go together and you get a seam line down the middle like that, you can either fill that in if it's not supposed to be there uh, and then it looks fantastic. Or, uh, like for example on the legs, um, find a leg. where's the leg? On the Cesarbi, it's great because this, the joint line is at the front of the leg and the back of the leg. Now, the beauty of this kit is they've actually made it into a, a panel line because it's got a little, it's got a little sort of square cross section like that. It's like the panel cut down like that. It's got a little square recess, so it's meant to look like a panel line anyway. So the seam line is hidden down that gap. If you've got a seam line, let's say this was a different kit and that was just a seam line that you wanted to get rid of, you could fill it or you can get chisels that will take the edge of the plastic and they will cut that little notch out. So you're making your own little square groove panel line and you can make seam lines into panel lines by doing that. Or sometimes you can just take the two bits that join in and you can cut a little triangular section here so you get that kind of shape. And that's the same thing. It, meant, it then takes it from being a seam line between two bits you've glued together or put together to a panel line that looks like it's meant to be there. There's all different ways around it. 
all different ways around it. Grundanium, I like, uh, oh, uh, I like seam lines, he says, as in keep articulation and movement or a single pose, I prefer to keep articulation. It's, it's, it, you can, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just to me personally, because I'm going to be spending, with a gumplet, I'll spend at least minimum 50 hours painting. I'm not going to move that thing once it's done. It's going to be literally never moved. It might be, if I sell it, it might get disassembled into legs and arms so it can be packed up to ship. Um, but I'm never going to repose it. It's never going to move. I'd, I'd rather just be able to paint everything and put all that stuff on there and not worry about it. But it's personal preference. Personal preference. Uh, I think that's going to do us. What time are we on? Half five. I need to go and make some dinner because I'm starving. It might be a null. So by make, I mean get. Um, but we've done quite a lot today. Got all the red done. That's quite nice. That's just the initial red. I've got to come back next time and do the squig orange, which is the subtle highlight just to give a little more brightness in there. And again, it just looks red to you guys, but it will look different. In, it looks different in real life. Trust me on that. Uh, there's been a little couple of bits where I've gone over other colours with the red, but that's fine. It's going to be hidden in weathering. Uh, and then when we've done all the red, it's then time to start doing things like chipping and that. But whether we do decals first and then chipping, I've not decided yet. I'll figure that out. So I'm going to call it there. That'll do us. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Gundanium says, me hungry too. Time to make lunch. Yes, always. Chris says, still on, I had a nap. We're just about to go, Chris. You slept through most of the program. Well done, good girl. Um, yeah, so uh, I will be back probably, possibly tomorrow. I said, I've got a lot of this stuff to do and you guys are keeping me company. So expect more of these streams as I go along. Uh, may get no warning, so make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell just to make sure you're notified if I start a stream. Uh, but that's going to do me. So I shall change my glasses so I can actually see what I'm doing on the telly box. I shall say thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Go make something awesome like this. Go be awesome. You there. You there. Be awesome. And I shall say until next time. Adios, amoebas. I've got to press a lot of buttons now. Hang on. Press that. Ha, ha, ha.